There we go. We are live. I'm Kev Baker. I am one of tonight's Woo Crew. And welcome to tonight's Freaky Friday. Oh, it's so good to be here tonight, folks. Obviously, I had a little night off last night. I must apologize for that, right? But I was, I was under the weather. And, you know, from time to time with everything that's happened, that may happen more often. And I can only apologize for that. But the thing is, tonight I'm back, I am rejuvenated, I'm ready to go. We have got Johnny Whistles with me as well. And of course, Johnny, this is Freaky Friday. Buckle up, man, I'll bring the rest of the guys in. But are you raring to go, Johnny? Friday, Kev, everybody's raring to go on a Friday. Yeah, it is absolutely fantastic. We have got some amazing stories to cover tonight, Kev, so looking forward to it, brother. Absolutely, and of course, it's not just me and Johnny here. This isn't the Kev Baker Show. This is the Freaky Friday, and we are the Woo Crew, and another absolutely essential mem- member of this mix, this Woo Crew that we put together is, of course, the man, Scotty Lopez. How are you doing after those uh, l- that little hiccup at the start there, man? Oh, I'm doing good, but um, the the real star of the show is is informing me that he needs to have his voice heard. It, it just doesn't feel the same. It's like, ah, there we go. See, like, he, he he was chomping at the bit. He was trying to push me over and get to the mic as quick as possible. It's like the Islamic call to prayer. Wookie has to kick off every Freaky Friday. And, you know, when I came <laughs> in myself there, I was so lonely. Just didn't feel right at all. And it's not just myself, Johnny and Scott tonight, because... Joining as well in a moment after Whistles goes and addresses his people in the chat room, Joe Joseph. He will be making a rare appearance on Freaky Friday. So, guys, the gang are back together. Who knows what's going to happen tonight? It's probably going to be the best Freaky Friday ever, right? Because, well, everyone is. It's always, it's always the best episode of Freaky Friday. Exactly. So, uh, Johnny Whistles. I hope you've got a drink there, dude, because uh, your your people await you. Well, I don't have a drink. In fact, uh, I'll need to get my wonderful partner to go and get me one, Kev. Johnny, I'm going to share with Scott what I was having a laugh with you before the show, because, Scotty, I honestly think, right, when Whistles rattles off these names here, he's like some kind of snake charmer, man. You know, the snake kind of goes in the trance. And honestly, the Wookiees in the chat room, I think they go into the trance of whistles. Not a bad place to be, by the way. J- just saying, Johnny. Well, Kev, what can I say? Do you know what I mean? We've got some amazing fans out there, and thank God they like me, Kev, because ah, there's loads of them in there. And they all give you a fantastic shout-out. Send you messages on Facebook. Take you for cups of coffee. Kev, doesn't get any better. No, honestly, Johnny, I might I might have a little laugh about things, but honestly, there's a reason why the audience love you, right? And that's because this whole network is real people, real radio. And you're one of the realest people I've ever met. And you just love other people, dude. You really do. I can totally attest to that. So, Johnny, without further ado, I'll let you go into the chat room and do your snake charming bit, man. No bother, Kev, you. <laughs> yeah, I'm in there just now, Kev, in the tinfoil hat area as we speak. There's probably about 40 people in the chat just now, so thanks, everybody, for turning up in the big numbers again. <laughs> 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 oh my god I can cobra. just see the cobra coming out of that basket there <laughs> <laughs> but we start with the number one the one and only Mr Anthony Patch we've got Billy Ray 3k love that we've got Daryl Dr Kayak Drone Free Zone we've got Lizard Chung get Nag Award Nancy Lalonde Get Richie J. Jones, Scotty Lopez, TFR Wookie, and myself, Mr. Whistles. We've got Andy Joe, who is Andrea. We've got Bison, Chat Rat George, what a name, love it. We've got Dark Horses, Dark Water, D. 
Davy Trotter, Dorito 56, we'll get Gaz, we'll get G Marchette, we'll get Iferian, Jabber Baby Wookie, oh, fantastic name, we'll get Kieran 70, Colonel, we'll get Margaret, we'll get Needle Gunner, we'll get Pat Moss, a lot of new names in there. We'll get Pete 252, Phyllis Lagan, who posts absolutely brilliant pictures in the chat. We'll get Becca G, Red Empty, Rockin' Real, Southern Matrix, Shane Virtue, Tony Phillips. We'll get Val Kyrie, who's the last one in there, Kev? Ah, uh, you know, I'm sorry. What the but hell was that? You see, Joe, you missed it because I was kind of telling people, I think I've sussed out why there's like this massive kind of following of whistles. You know, it's it's the chat room. When he does the chat room, that whistling, he's like a snake charmer, dude. He, puts, he must be, like the Pied Piper. There, there, we, that, there we go. But, you know, I thought that was priceless. Scotty, that is as good as your Photoshop skills, my man. It really is. And Joe... There you are. You've reappeared yeah. from the other dimension. You know, I was saying to the guys, I think when you disappear periodically, you step into some kind of TARDIS, dude. Go away for 18 months, do a kind of mission for the Cosmic Core, come back and only maybe five, ten minutes have passed in this dimension. How you doing, man? You said TARDIS. <laughs> I said Cosmic Core, all in the same kind of sentence. Brilliant. Oh, that's awesome. I wish I had a TARDIS. There's no <laughs> way. I mean, come on, man. Oh, if only phone booths were still around these days. It really would be kind of cool to have that. Um, no, 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 it's great. But- it's great to be back uh, with you guys and three hours of fun filled, woo filled excitement. You know, make the most of the TARDIS, Joe. Make the most of it because if the BBC is anything to go by, they'll probably swap it out for some kind of gay bar soon because they changed Doctor Who from a man to a chick. I don't get it. I don't but get this it. Is, this is what they're doing to blur the lines. You know that. I mean, this is. <laughs> I know, but. Yeah, just more. When you start playing about with Doctor Who, you've definitely crossed the line. Absolutely crossed the line. You don't touch the Doctor. Hey, you get Doctor Woo. Woo. <laughs> Doctor Woo. We should have a rival show, guys. Doctor Woo. Doctor Woo. That'd be <laughs> awesome. We could actually like uh, do like a little mini series on that. Yeah, we step into the studio and we all just reappear at a different time in history or something. Be awesome. That, that would be awesome. Where are we so, going to start off tonight? No, that was my question to you. So I no, didn't, that's my question to you. Whistles. We shall come to <laughs> you first. But Joe, you missed it last week. Whistles flew the Freaky Friday all I the- heard. So, Johnny. I heard. I, whistles, I, I, you know. Now, but don't let us stop us from letting you take the bull by the horns whistles. I mean, after all, if, if you want to run with it, then let's run with it, baby. Well, I'm running with it, Joe. <laughs> now I'm going, to put, I'm going to put a picture in the chat here. Yeah. Now, I don't know if anybody can tell me what this thing is because I've never seen anything like that in my life before. Now, this was floating on the water in the Atchafalaya Basin under the bridge at Moss Bluff near Bro, uh, Bro Bridge in Louisiana. Now, I'm not sure what this is because I've nev- never seen anything like it. It's, I mean, it looks like it's got a big row of teeth, as you can see. But it also, I mean, what's that big giant hole at the other end? It That's looks in- like a mouth on top of a mouth. It's weird. Yeah, Johnny, uh, our friend Alistair, he sent me this the other day, I think I've seen it, and I think maybe Sarah as well, a few people sent me this, and I can't figure this one out, and we look at some strange kind of creatures, right, and I know that when whales and other kind of sea animals die, when they get bloated and they're decomposing, they they can take on really different kind of appearances, right, but I, I can't honestly figure out what this is at all. Now, where was it that it was actually filmed again? It was in Louisiana, Kev. Now, for listeners out there who aren't in the chat room and who can't see this, I'll take a kind of stab at describing it. It's like, I don't know, some kind of, it's like the top of a whale and then it's got almost like an an alien mouth. It looks like there's a big fang there as well and then it's like another set of teeth right up the side. 
I, I don't know what I'm looking at, guys. Joe, come on. What, what, I think on? I think what we're looking at right there is a Malaysian snarfle tit. <laughs> 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 Just well, so bison, in the, bison in the chat says it's a hippopotamus hog. Yeah, we could go with that too. That's yeah. all good. <laughs> Genetically engineered hog. Yeah. I'm trying to think uh, of teeth like that though. I mean, uh, if that is teeth, I mean, I don't know. It's same. Um, is that an eye that we're seeing just to the left of the teeth? Uh, I don't know. Come on, Scotty. What, what, what educators? What are we looking at here? Uh, I, 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 I have no idea. Exactly. But, See, this is I just mean, out of the realm of uh, what is it? the photoshoppery. But, I'm, but, I'm calling but, it. Well, I mean, for, first thing that comes to my mind is Louisiana, Gulf of Mexico, yeah. BP oil spill, chemicals in the water. Yeah. Yeah, definitely you know, like mm. some. Sh- it's a mutated shrimp. That's or what it is. It's a corrects it shrimp. Or that too, yeah. Although I think uh, now... Correct me if I'm wrong, but crocodiles aren't really known to be out in the uh, Gulf of Mexico. <laughs> just saying. Yeah, they, yeah. They, it's it's mostly just freshwater alligators. But then again, babies don't usually climb mountains and find themselves um, on top of mountains, dead, naked, um, like two mountain ridges away from where it went missing. True. So, Man, you never know, Joseph. No, no, you never do know. It's very interesting indeed. Um, speaking of ugly things, Kev, you, you sent a article from Cryptozoology about gargoyle-like creatures being spotted in Spain. Since we're talking about really fugly-looking whatever they are, apparently a British man claims he saw an unidentified winged creature in southern Spain. Well, uh, <laughs> not the moth man. Not again. He might not have heard of the moth man, and the only thing he can compare it to is a gargoyle. Yeah, well, uh, Alex Naserik said that he was in Santa Maria de la Aguila in Almeria when he witnessed this being. He says, I was in South Spain for nearly one year. I was always a nature enthusiast, so I traveled a lot. And he said, because... The really hot weather in those regions, people often leave their windows open at night for better air circulation. Now, Alex was sleeping when he woke up to a sound he wasn't able to immediately identify. He says it was around 1 a.m. and I thought it was someone in trouble. My instincts told me there's a woman who's having trouble and she might be in a lot of pain. At some point, I was annoyed that I had to witness it. I knew he said it wasn't an owl. Now, Reportedly, Alex went to the window to investigate when the noise actually got louder and clearer. He said, my flat, my flat was on the fourth floor um, and the last floor, by the way, where I had a nice terrace with a view in front of the block over the parking lot. He says, I looked out the window over the terrace, but my view was restricted only to the far side of the parking lot. The lights were on, so the visibility was good. But in order to see the full area of the car park, I had to get out on the terrace so I could see in front of the block. And he said, I was about to go over into the terrace and I saw something big come over the building. And in that instance, the noise was made again. He says, I literally froze. I wanted to duck, but I was amazed. He said, a strange wing animal about 25 meters or about 82 feet was uh, away from him. He saw it looked like a dog with wings. He says, I couldn't see the front legs, just the rear ones. I didn't have front legs or it says it didn't have front legs. So I don't know. It could be the moth man, moth dog man. Mm. But he did say it was heavy. And he says the way it flapped its wings looked either tired or about to fall to the ground. He says the legs were hanging. It seemed fatherless. It looked like skin. It had pale color. It looked pinkish. But at nighttime, the lights from the parking lot have a different spectrum. So he says he didn't see, couldn't really tell, uh, you know, what, what it actually was. He says it looked like fall, it was falling down, but with a slow flap of the wings, it would actually rise up and f- 
and forward almost instantly. And he says it looked powerful, not like a moth. So pretty interesting. He says the animal then disappeared. But um, as far as like the additional features, he says that it was a thick creature with a short, short beak. And it looked like it had a carnivorous nose. He said the head seemed to be stretched at the back, bulky torso or body, curved wings with arms, um, spanned around two to three meters wider, nine to ten feet. It had thick, powerful back legs that were held diagonally, almost vertically. It had a long, thin tail and a heavy, slow movement. Wow. What kind of moths does this guy know that he said, well, it obviously wasn't a moth. No crap, Sherlock, at two to three meters wide. <laughs> a big moth. Exactly. But it says here as well that in July 2015, two people in Nevada reported seeing a creature that reminded them of a petrosaur, a flying reptile believed to have gone extinct only about 65 million years ago. doesn't end there because two weeks later, a minister and her daughter claimed to have seen an unidentified creature that looked like it was, get this, straight out of Jurassic Park. In September that year, multiple eyewitnesses reported seeing a winged humanoid in Singapore, and two months later, a Portugal student said he had seen a giant bat-like creature in the southern side of the country, and that for me is definitely a mothman. But it just shows you, right, this isn't like, if it was just a one-off thing, yeah, whatever. But it's multiple sightings of things that sound similar, guys. It really isn't. Stranger all- things, maybe? Oh. <laughs> I mean, think about it, though. Look at what we're doing and what we're screwing around with with regard to portals, right? And opening uh, gateways to different dimensions. Is it out of the realm of possibility that they don't let something through? And Like this. Remember the Department of Energy? was actually on that show. They were the ones that had the secret kind of facility where they were mind controlling the right. child, right? Th- well, they're, also, they're also the ones, by the way, that do the chemtrail program. So the, it's there's the, a history there, Kev. Yeah, and they came out on a talk show and said, listen, you know, there's been a lot of talk of us working in parallel dimensions. And the, the actual director of the Department of Energy gets asked, you know, is there any truth to that? And he says, well, we do. And then just last week, right, he couldn't make this up because the Department of Energy became one of the first kind of customers to the D-Wave quantum cloud. What do they deal, deal with? Other dimensions. What a coinky dink. Jaws, nothing connected here, nothing to see, guys. Move along. No. Strange but- Things, by the way, returns at the end of this month, just to tell all my fellow mm. buffs out there, yeah, great show. Mm. That's excellent. Excellent show. So, so much we actually hijacked their kind of font and their background for tonight. <laughs> yeah, well, but, but in all honesty, guys, think about this. DOE, of course, does a lot of these projects that are hidden in plain sight. But there's this. You have um, reports in Iraq of... Um, what was it? Uh, a blue giant that came out <laughs> and like terrorized some troops that were on a search and rescue mission. Well, we do laugh, right? But I mean, you also have to factor in, and there might be new listeners out there. Go and check out the fact that there was like special forces. The minute we got into Iraq, where were they going? Oh, they were going and retrieving ancient archaeology. What? Middle middle of a war? Why not? <laughs> That's what I do, loot and pillage. I mean, and that's the good stuff there. The hell with gold and silver. What do you want that for? Don't don't bother to look at the fact that Saddam thought he was a reincarnation of Nebuchadnezzar, and he was. Think about, well, how, how much is a CRISPR kit these days? What, like six hundred bucks? Why not? Let's just bring back. Let's just bring back Gilgamesh. I mean, come on. Well, you see, yeah, report- you can buy strands of DNA on the on the internet for eighty nine dollars. Right, or you could get, you know, Kev can um, make a phone call to his uh, BFF, Craig Ventner, and, um, Not my know. BFF, but get this right, he is teaming up with Elon Musk, and they're talking about sending synthetic life up to Mars so that it can grow some kind of habitat, get something going for, you know, the first kind of Martianauts getting there. You Not- mean like ter- terraforming and stuff? Absolutely terraforming. But before we go to Scott for more kind of cryptid stuff, I mean, Johnny, 
you hear these reports about things that sound like pterodactyls and stuff, right? And when I hear that, I really have to keep my mind open to the fact that, guess what? It might be a pterodactyl, because I'm sure they must have DNA of all these dinosaurs over the years. And with what they can do now, tell me it's not beyond them, John. I, I wouldn't think it's beyond. I don't think anything is beyond them now, to be honest with you. I think they could bring anything back if they wanted to. I mean, they were talked not that long ago that they were going to bring the the woolly mammoth back. And, Kev, I don't think that's a hard thing for them to do now. They're, they're way, way more advanced than what we even... You're right. Yeah. It, Interesting it, thing, though. Let me throw this in. Say they do bring it back, Scotty, right? Can it live in the environment that we currently have today, knowing that when the woolly mammoth walked the earth, the the earth was different then? Atmospherics mm-hmm. was different. Everything was different. So what happens to an animal that you bring back that wasn't designed for this environment? What do you think? Well, yeah, I mean, th- th- that was the point I was actually about to make. Um, you know, what if a lot of these sightings, like the one we just spoke about, <clears throat> remember the guy said that it looked like that the that this uh, flying creature was almost like sickly or whatever, like it could barely keep itself up in the air. It was taking these long, you know, what if what if these really are, you know, like sort of Jurassic Park <laughs> style things occurring and oops, you know, uh oh, one of them got out there. But then the, you know, whoever's in charge of these f- facilities are like, well, don't worry about it. It's not like it has anything to reproduce with and it's not going to survive long outside by itself. So, you know, you know, whatever. Um, yeah, you're right. I mean, back when these creatures like dinosaurs and woolly mammoths lived i mean look the the co2 levels on the planet were like astronomical like way beyond anything you know currently that's why plants were like gigantic and that's why all those animals were gigantic i mean just look at the size of dinosaurs that all correlates to the amount of co2 that was in the atmosphere you know at that time you know (laughs) everything just scales up right you know you have your co2 uh, your plant life is going to scale up with the co2 then whatever feeds on that plant life is going to scale up with that and so on and so forth so yeah definitely uh if you try to bring back something that was um you know, evolutionary, uh, you know, set up evolutionary to uh, survive in a particular sort of environment. If you take it out of its environment, it's not going to live that long. No, very much. You're absolutely right. You know, and and in the chat room, of course, they said, well, they can genetically modify anything to survive. Absolutely, they could. But is it like a mechanism of like kind of a safety mechanism? Let's just not do that. That's exactly. Yeah, that's exactly kind of what I was getting at is. Yeah. It, it, it can survive in the controlled environment that they set up for it. But if it does manage to get loose, then, you know, that's the control mechanism. Right. You know, no harm, they, no foul. They, it's just going to yeah, die. They, yeah. They know that if it gets loose, it's only going to survive for so long before, it, you know, just kicks the bucket. Yeah. So they, that, that seems to be pretty interesting to me. I, I thought that was uh I bet you Jurassic Park for the elites is either right next to uh, Jupiter Island in Florida or Bernie Epstein's Love Island. You just know it. You just know it. Yeah, maybe. But but at the same time, though, you know, unless they unless they make changes to their uh, genetics to be able to compensate for the different environment, these things aren't going to live too long in this in this environment. It's just totally and completely different. That's you know. But, that's but always thing. always remember what the guy from Jurassic Park said: Nature will find a way to survive. Oh, sure. It'll adapt. It just takes time. But mm-hmm. this, but the adaptation, um, would ha- it, it, I don't think it can adapt that, that fast. You know what I mean? I don't think if you just brought back, um, a creature that wasn't designed to, to be in this environment, I don't think it could adapt fast enough. I think it can adapt with changes to the environment that happens subtly over time. But, but if you're, if you're, if you're splicing it with animals that can, that are already adapted to our current environment, it oh, wouldn't yeah, be now, so now much. It would, yeah, it wouldn't be so much of a stretch for it to just uh, suddenly sort of make that, make that jump and, and adapt to the environment, right? Like say a woolly mammoth, for example, well, you know, in order to bring back a woolly mammoth, you're going to have to use genetics from an elephant, which can survive just fine. Right. Uh, in our current, in our current system. So, um, 
you know, would it be so much of a stretch for that woolly mammoth to kind of uh, power through and manage to survive in our current environment? Or, uh, or you just take our current or, elephant and just give it hair. No need, no need, because you can be sure DARPA and Boston Dynamics will be rapidly creating an exoskeleton for the woolly mammoth. To the second half of, or the second half of this first hour of Freaky Arr. Friday. Arr. And we're here tonight with our amazing guests. We've got Joe Joseph, Scotty Lopez, Mr. Kev Baker, and myself, Johnny Whistles. And again, we've come up with some amazing topics. And I think um, we're going to get some Bigfoot news from Mr. Lopez. Is that right? Whistles, before that, you have to apologize to the Wookiee. (laughs) You marked the Wookiee. Uh, do you know, it, Kev, it's just me jumping in. <laughs> I'm really sorry, but sorry. <laughs> Man, he's, he, he's looking at me right now with an extreme look of displeasure, but he says he says you're forgiven, Whistles. Oh, thanks. Good. I'll bring him a donut. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Scott, what's happening with the Bigfoot, man? Okay, well, I've got this uh, article pulled up here from a Mysterious Universe, and it says, uh, Truly bizarre accounts of spontaneously ba- uh, vanishing Bigfoot. Uh, the Bigfoot phenomena is already quite strange enough, as it is, and has long been ground zero for all manner of sightings of people seeing something large, ape-like, and decidedly not human prowling the forests of North America. The main theory behind these encounters is that we are possibly dealing with some undiscovered bipedal primate, perhaps even an ancestral species of human. Either way, uh, a flesh and blood creature. However, there has been much speculation over the years that this may not be the case at all, and that these beings could be somewhat far weirder than that. Among these are reports of... uh, are reports of uh, Bigfoot that have seemingly phased out of reality, gone invisible or otherwise vanishing right before witnesses' eyes, although perhaps not quite as common as the more traditional sightings um, reports. uh, They nevertheless come in and suggest that possibly something more is going on here than a mere undiscovered animal. Uh, One very interesting account of an apparently vanishing Bigfoot Um, was related on the radio show Coast to Coast AM on a July 15, 2016 episode hosted by George Norrie. Uh, The witness, who called himself Gene from Albuquerque, New Mexico, claimed that he had been hunting for elk at around 7 a.m. out near a border town on the uh, Arizona-Mexico border called Gallup. Uh, The land was located on a Navajo, uh, Navajo reservation and described as being very remote, rugged, and mountainous. As Gene prowled through the rough landscape looking for his quarry, uh, he claims that he got the distinct feeling that something large was following him, perhaps even stalking him. Uh, he would explain what happened uh, next, thus, uh, the transc- uh, thus uh, this is the transcript from the original show. And this is what Gene said. Uh, I am an, uh, I'm an ex-Navy corpsman. Uh, I know something, or I know when something's following me. Uh, I'm about an hour and a half back in, and I'm way out in the middle of nowhere. So I go around the road and end up on a box uh, canyon on top of this mesa that overlooks the boonies. Uh, It's like a thousand foot drop. Okay, real quick, I head back towards the box canyon. Uh, I was trying to get away from whatever is following me. All of a sudden, I hear these thundering footsteps and I lean up against the wall, and here comes about seven horses from out of the middle of nowhere into this box canyon. Wild horses. I get around to the box canyon, and there it is. It jumps off the top of a 20-foot dead, 20-foot dead end box canyon. Uh, I was at the bottom. I'm looking up, and now I'm looking at it. And it jumped uh, one foot down, uh, one foot up on the uh, side. Uh, it was exactly what everybody says that you guys talk about uh nori that says bigfoot uh, and he says yeah and i'm like and i'm in the middle of the indian reservation on the top of a little mesa it blew my mind it looked right at me i was less than 50 yards from it Uh, i took off running 
I didn't freeze. I just took off running. Uh, then something threw a rock at me. It was a huge rock. I'd say it weighed about eight pounds. Uh, it would have killed me. Uh, I looked and I tripped out at a 120 to 200 yards. There it was. And it looked at me. I'm sorry, George, but that far, I'm telling you, it blew my mind. It threw an eight pound, an eight pound rock, at least 120 yards. And this thing was not small. Uh, this thing was huge. Um, the terrified witness then decided to take a shot at the thing with his rifle and claims that he actually directly hit it. But after taking a few steps, the massive beast simply disappeared into thin air as if it had never been there at all. Uh, when he went to investigate, there were found to be enormous footprints imprinted in the ground, but no blood or other physical evidence left behind. And there was no sign at all of where the beast could have possibly gone. He was absolutely baffled and would explain. And then the transcript continues uh, him saying, um, I don't know uh, where it's from, uh, but wherever it came from, when I hit it, it had the ability to just disappear into thin air. You know, I looked, I followed the footprints. I walked the 120 yards. It wasn't that far from the top of a Mesa. Uh, it had nowhere to go. Uh, never, ever have I, uh, have I seen it again and never, ever have I gone back? Not by myself. So that was his, uh, that was this guy's encounter with, a, a vanishing Bigfoot. Quite interesting. An interdimensional Sasquatch. I love them. And I, I would, I would have to think that, that, you know, because Sasquatch is interdimensional, that's why everybody's having such a rough go trying to like, you know, get pictures with them and whatnot. Imagine try to shoot it, shoot at it. What's that? Why? Way? What the hell would they do that for? Exactly, dude. See, I, I just want to get like a picture of it. Hey, could you put on this Hawaiian shirt for me? Okay, good. Now, let's just get a picture together. Great, thank you. I need it for. I don't know I, if, if something if something tried to throw an eight pound rock at me, I probably wouldn't be very um happy about that. It's you know, not I, even as dude. That's like a very lightweight bowling ball. You know when it's not, <laughs> that's just that's kind of like a Sasquatch high five. So you, that so you know they like you if they only throw an eight pound rock at you. See, so when you look at that kind of thing, though, that's actually quite rare when it comes to Bigfoot and Sasquatch sightings because. I honestly haven't heard of any kind of attacks or anything like that before. What about you, Whistles? I've not heard of attacks, Kev, but I've heard of them throwing stones, um, usually at people in the woods, um, knocking on trees to frighten them. But actually to get that close um, and throw a rock that size, then mm, that's pretty freaky. Maybe worthy of shooting right enough then. No, I wouldn't shoot it, kid. No. I mean, you just... Hey, big fella, come on. Sit down, have a beer. Tell me where you live. Where's your brothers, sisters? Where's your mum and dad? You know what I mean? Be nice to it. <laughs> what would you feed it? Donuts. You think so? Anything it wanted. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah. that's that's probably a better answer, but but I'm just thinking, you know, like you, so you strike up a conversation with Sasquatch. What do you say? You know, and is it does it end up being that Sasquatch is actually like a really intelligent um guy with or gal or it whatever that uh you know, you're able to communicate with. I don't know. What if it's it just Traveling pranksters. It could be that too. It could be well, us playing jokes you, on ourselves. What if you stood there, right, with a, a roast chicken in your hand, with your hands out? Do you think it would attack you or would it Tied come for the your chicken? Neck like a necklace. That's what I'm like, Wear it like a medallion, like a, a rotisserie chicken. <laughs> 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 and then we'll see how intelligent they really are. Well, That's what I'm saying. Your confidence blows me away, Joe. I'll stand about 10 meters back and see how you get on, okay? <laughs> In the chat room, they say, maybe it's vegetarian. It could very well be. That's what I'm saying. We'll put it to the mm -hmm. test. We'll put whistles out there with a rotisserie chicken wrapped around his neck. <laughs> I would do it. No problem. Oh, no, I wouldn't because I'd probably get mauled by a bear or something. You know what I mean? Knowing my luck. Before it even happens. Still That's right. 
we're looking at something that lives just out of our kind of frequency range, something like that. It definitely has to be going to some other, if you want to call it dimension, perhaps, because mm. this is a common theme where they just disappear, no trace of them, never find bodies of them. Where do they go? So it's something I, I definitely, I can't prove, but Bigfoot interdimensional. I, yeah, I, I buy it. I totally buy it. The thing is, and that's what gets me too, is that even if they are interdimensional or they have the capability of of, of doing that, I still... I'm still astounded that there's no the uh, carcasses or bones or anything from any, there's always an accident. You know what I mean? There's always something that happens where, you know, you've got grays, people have seen grays before. And then you've got Roswell, right? Where they apparently had, um, you know, bodies. So uh, there's always things that happen that result in, um, there being things left behind, elongated skulls down in South America. You know, you can go on and on and on, but no Sasquatch, none of them, not a not a trace outside of what you see in like photography. What if what if when a what if when a Sasquatch dies, its its a uh, body sort of returns back to whatever dimension it came from. Oh, speaking of, uh, since you're talking about that too, I just watched guys last night, um, the Marvel movie that came out last year, Dr. Strange. <laughs> you guys got to watch that. Damn. You want to talk about interdimensional madness. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's awesome. Yeah. Wow. And, um, my favorite, one of my favorite actors, Benedict Cumberbatch is in it and he's like, he's the main character. But you want to talk about interdimensional. I swear to you that that is how I believe the Sasquatch. If I could illustrate how they travel, that's how they do it. Mm. Opening portals, mm. walking through, that kind of thing. And even he had like artifacts that would help do things even if he may have died. So, you know, it could very well be that that's the case, that they have like a fail safe. But damn. Yeah, I mean, it would, I mean... Now, it, you know, it kind of maybe makes a little more sense, you know, going by what this uh, guy that called into Coast to Coast said. He said it disappeared right after he shot him. Maybe he did kill him and he just his body disappeared. Right. right. He just went went back to uh, whatever dimension he was from or, you know. Yeah, no, interesting. No so I can't wait for Stranger Things to come out again for, you know, the now it's a, it's a whole season, right, Kev? Yeah, it should be. Joe. Yeah. Oh. Of course, that's all of about two nights for me because I'll binge watch the hell out of it <laughs> and I'll be done and disappointed again. And I, yeah, I, 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 fi I finally got around to watching it and I've been I, as soon as I got like, yeah, first episode hooked me and then I just binge watched it for. I know it's horrible, isn't it? Yeah. And then and then you're disappointed because you can't watch it some more. You've just become a hopeless addict. <laughs> you get slammed into withdrawal. If you like Freaky and, Friday, you're going to love Stranger Things, I would imagine. I, yeah, oh, definitely. Yeah, I mean, that's right up anybody's alley that likes Freaky. But, well, I mean... Pfft. Talking about Strange Things, what yes. about this one? Because this is from Mysterious Universe as well. Now, it says, fans of the TV show Lost will remember one of its first mysteries that involved the radio signal. The stranded passengers picked up that was eventually tracked to an earlier castaway. Mm. Danielle Russo, who recorded the distress message loop that had been broadcast from the uninhabited tower for the last six, uh, 16 years. Now, this actual lost fiction meets Russian reality. Uh, now, this is in St. Petersburg, where an empty radio station had been broadcasting nothing but two mysterious tones, some occasional numbers, and some Russian words as well. Now, it's been doing this 24-7 for over 40 years, and this is an abandoned headquarters of the Dharma Initiative. Now, according to a new project by a new report by the BBC, the mystery of the radio station is not its location, but its purpose it's known as MDZHB. 
which some to uh, some still refer it to UB UVB seventy six. Now, signal which is broadcast at four six two five kilohertz can be picked up by any shortwave radio tuned to that frequency. The radio towers and abandoned buildings are visible from behind an iron fence and have been located there since 1973 when the signal began broadcasting. Other than buzzing noise, odd Russian words that are broadcast every few days, the station has a fan base that listen to it religiously. They refer it to they refer to it as the buzzer, and they keep track of this. Now the most Famous transmission came in January 24, 2013, when listeners heard Command 135 initiated. Now, that message, coupled with the station more recently broadcasting from a second location near Moscow, has some speculating that it's military, military related. Not a surprise in Russia, right enough. Cause one is that the operation is a dead hand switch an autonomous system set to launch nuclear missiles in the event that no humans are left to push the button. It seems kind of futile that point, or that point seems futile. Another is used by the Russians as part of a missile tracking system. Now, that's where the theory is there's a way for Russian spies to send each other secret coded messages. The command 135 initiated message in 2013 has some suggestion it was a signal of full military readiness for something. Now, it's pretty strange, really, that this thing has been going on for 40 years. Letters, numbers, names like Boris, Roman, Olga, Mikhail, Anna, Larissa. You wonder what this is. I mean, if it's abandoned... Why is it still sending out signals, and what is it really meant for? The, oh, the other thing is, Kev, this is this uh, like signals for another dimension because we don't know what it is. Oh, whistles! You're going to end up getting stabbed with a polonium-tipped umbrella, man. You can't go you talking about this it. kind of stuff. And you know, I suppose it's mysterious and strange, unless you know what it's actually talking about. Johnny, I'm going to have to take you out, man. It's my calling station. It's how I talk to home back at the Kremlin, dude. <laughs> Russian collusion confirmed. No, yeah. I love all this kind of stuff. I absolutely love it. You know, it's like the number stations as well. And this one here has obviously got some kind of military purpose, but what it's actually for, uh, who only knows, guys? Who only knows? What do you think? Yeah, it, it, Scott, go ahead, Joe. When no, you go after you, what, after you, Scotty. No, no, I mean, it was just making me think, isn't, isn't there also another sort of like a Russian signal that's being put out there that they call the woodpecker or whatever? It, it, <laughs> isn't that? <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah, you know, I mean, there's all kinds of, I'm sure we even have, you know, I'm sure the U.S. even has our own sort of um you know, similar things that yeah, are like, putting I wonder out. How many, I wonder how many actual signals are actually out there. You know what I mean? That signal something to someone somewhere. There's so many. I don't know. I, I think people but, make a little you know, more out. This is the one you guys have to be listening for right now. Three, nine, seven, one, five. Three, nine, seven, one, five. No, that's actually from a North Korean one. I know that's in English there, but it later goes on into North Korean as well, and it sounds like that crazy kind of newscaster that we see the, all the time. See, now, so, if it was me, right? Listen, if it was me, <laughs> and let me just say, I'm Kim Jong-un, and I'm over there, right? I would, I would do that and put those out there knowing that the army of tinfoil hatters that are out there are going to take it and run with it big time. I would I would throw it out there just well, to do well it. not not even tinfoil hatters just the <laughs> the the military and whoever are are paying attention to them in general yeah, but would I mean, probably look at us. think that they're look at us. we're we're like yeah. googling over it ah yes and and rightfully so because that's what we do best you know and, but it, it, there's no doubt we would definitely have to screw with 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 each other if that was the case 
you know, hey, and, I'm and a who's to, who's to, yeah, and who's to say it even it could just mean absolutely nothing. And it just uh, as a way of tying up resources to follow something that doesn't even right. That doesn't even mean anything. Right. Exactly. No, you make a great point. That's the other thing, too. You know, tie up resources. Why not? Now we've got like uh, this radio receiver. This has to be monitored 24 seven by somebody. Now we've just taken one extra person out of the loop. And you keep doing it time and time again. Yeah, you make them stretch their resources out. That's a good point. Yeah, or, or you just you just put in like something that where they would go, oh, my gosh, this probably means something. And then they call up their superiors and they get a group of people in there to analyze, you know, yeah. just something that in, ends up being nothing. So lots of yeah, people smoking know. Sherlock Holmes pipes. Yeah. What could well, it mean? Well, yeah, I think that. Yeah. Hmm. And like I said, I'm sure I'm sure we we have our own radio stations doing the same thing. And the Russians are like, yeah, there's a mysterious signal that's been coming from Alaska or so, something like that. You know, uh, it, it, it's probably just a game that's being played by a lot of different countries, actually. Um, but, yeah, I'm sure, you know, it, it's also a good way of, you know, actually being something legit, you know, communicating um, encrypted sort of messages or um, codes to anybody who knows how you know how to decipher it or understand what it's actually saying, oh, well, um, you'll be getting the yeah. umbrella too, Scott. Watch yourself. <laughs> <laughs> speaking so, of yeah, codes, I, mean, I don't know. Well, speaking of codes, you know that um, one organization that uses codes quite heavily and has agendas worldwide is the Vatican. And did you know, according to one of my favorite tinfoil hat websites, Neon Netta. Oh, my God. I love that damn site. It's so... Because it's utter fiction. Oh, it's totally fiction. I love it. Oh. Apparently, the Vatican is calling a meeting to discuss the global depopulation agenda for the new world order. <laughs> yes. Pope Francis, you see, wants to kill you. With his evil Jesuit plan. <laughs> <laughs> you don't like this? I like it. There's a lot of there's a lot of just craziness on here. Oh. Remember that like Sorcha Fowl? Sasha oh. Fowl. Yeah, 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 yeah. I know it. I know. It's right up there, dude. But I mean, like, come on. But this is that's not to say, right, that let's be serious now, because okay. although that might be questionable just because of the source, there is definitely a plan coming out of the Vatican. Well, there's totally plans. Yeah. No, don't get me wrong. I'm not. But the, the depopulation thing, I don't think the Catholics are really into depopulation. I'm not. I think uh, if, if anything, they're into, you know, let's let's populate the earth with us. Well, the current pope seems to be the one that's kind of watering down. Catholicism as we knew it, and he, if anyone, he's going to be the one that calls for some kind of one world religion. Right. No, I mean, I, and and it's been a, in the works for a very long time. Yeah, but, absolutely. But but as far as agendas are concerned, you know, um, depopulation is already alive and well. They don't need the Catholic backing on that one because, uh, you know, just take a look at what we've done to ourselves. Take away all of the, you know, Planned Parenthood and all that kind of stuff. It, it, all that aside, we bathe ourselves in Wi-Fi intentionally and um, subject ourselves to uh, all these chemicals and pharmaceuticals. And as a result, you know, um, sperm count in men are, have been halved in the Western world. So we're doing it to ourselves, you know. It's great that there's an agenda to depopulate the earth, but we're doing it to ourselves. And it's being marketed to us through the culture of convenience. See, you don't need the Catholic Church to have a, a meeting about depopulation. We're doing it to ourselves. It's okay. All they got to do is have a party and say, hey, all right, it's working. Woo! You know, they, they drink the Kool-Aid. And we do. We do. I mean, who wants to have to run... Cat six cable throughout your house and plug in directly. I mean, come on, who wants to do that? You said they cut like the male sperm by fifty percent now. Fifty percent, yeah. I mean, even if right, God forbid that fertility rates drop to zero, 
I mean, with the science they've got now, that would probably be perfect for them. It'd be like that's Aldous. the whole justification, Kev. And that would be Aldous Huxley's Brave New World. All that's it. One. That's it. They would have. They will. That will be initiated, and it will be sooner rather than later. You wait and watch. It's going to happen because um, this will become a crisis in every single first world Western country. Birth rates are below two point one which is unsustainable. They have to be above 2.1 in order to keep the population going. Every single first world country is below 2.1. It's never going to, it's, we're looking at a major decrease in population, huge. So they bring it to a manageable number by people doing it to themselves. And then they'll bring about the solution, which is, don't worry about having to reproduce or anything like that. We'll just engineer babies. Now we don't exactly. have to worry about it. I'm sorry, Mr. and Mrs. Jones, that you can't have a child. Our number two right here on Freaky Friday. And you see, I let the Wookiee bring us in whistles. That's so how you got to do it, man. You don't want to fall on the bad <laughs> side of the Wookiee. You really don't. But that's right, folks. This is Freaky Friday. And we are on TFRlive.com. Com. I'm Kev Baker, we've got Scott Lopez, we have got Johnny Whistles and Joe Joseph And if you're just joining us, where have you been? Because this one really has been good so far guys First hour has been amazing And for you listeners out there now, turn down the lights Because we're about to turn the woo up about, I don't know, three or four notches Because Johnny Whistles, you're at it again here What have you dug up now man? Well, Kev, amazingly, um, America is the mysterious forest of vanishing children. Now, it says that there's places in the world which seem to harbour ominous secrets and reverberate with the echoes of dark history, but sprawled out within Los Angeles County in Southern California are the San Gabriel Mountains, and Sierra Polona Mountains, and within this vast expanse of wilderness, not far from the urban jungle of nearby Los Angeles, lies the Angeles National Forest, a total of 700,176 acres. Now, the forest encompasses large portions of protected land that remain in remarkably pristine condition, considering its pro- uh, proximities to such a densely populated area. Now, the thing is, in August of 1956, 11-year-old Brenda Hill was visiting the area in North Carolina to see her sister. She made fast friends with a neighbourhood boy, 13-year-old Donald Lee Baker, on the morning of August the 6th, 1956. Now, the two kids set out on their bicycles to go exploring in the San Gabriel Canyon area. Now, they would never be seen or heard from again. When the two children d- didn't return, there was a massive search launched of the area by a joint police force and Navy personnel as well as hundreds of volunteers who skilled the wellness looking for any sign of them. But after days of searching, they were only able to recover Brenda's bicycle and Donald's jacket, which were found near Morris Dam, about a quarter of a mile away from where they'd last seen. Now, two months later, Donald's bicycle was also found at Glendora Elementary School, where a student claimed to have found it in the forest not long after the two had vanished. The following year, in the spring of 1957, there'd be another baffling disappearance in the area on March 23. Eldon Bowman and his brother-in-law, Gordon Wicks, were taking a hike in the Arroyo Seco in Alta... Oh, this this is all these Spanish names. Altadena, California, along with their young children, the oldest who was eight-year-old Tommy Bowman. Now, the same point during the hike, Tommy ran ahead and passed out of sight around the bend. But when the rest rounded the, the same bend, the boy was nowhere to be seen. The family at first assumed he must be nearby as he'd just been there and their, and their home was only around a mile away. 
but calling out his name got no response and the authorities were soon notified. Search parties quickly converged upon the area and it was thought that Tommy could not have gotten far and he would be located soon because you can imagine when a young child of maybe eight year old goes missing, they would always really put maybe at the very most a five mile radius round uh, because you can't really go very far. But in the case, uh, sorry, he was just gone and it was as if he'd stepped off the face of the earth, leaving police baffled. The only possible clue in the case came two weeks after the, the vanishing when a nearly anonymous letter arrived at the Bowman family home claiming that the boy was still alive and in the company of an unidentified adult male. And another letter would say he was living in Oklahoma, but it's unclear whether these were genuine leads or not, and they ultimately led nowhere. Now, that boy was never found as well. The next child to die was a six-year-old Bruce Howard Kremen, who was on a camping trip with the YMCA, along with a large group comprised of 80 other children and adults in the Buckhorn Flat in the Angeles National Forest. Now, on July the 12th, 1960, Bruce was allegedly hiking with some other children and an adult supervisor around 300 yards from the camp when he became tired and was sent back to rest, which was still within sight. When the boy had just about reached the camp, the supervisor turned to continue on with the other kids, but the boy didn't actually reach the camp. When it was realised he was missing just minutes later, again, another extensive search carried out by the group, who were then joined by the police and volunteers, and again, nobody ever found this boy. And it's completely amazing, really, to think that these children can go and really quickly like that. And as I was saying earlier, earlier on, there was a young child that, I mean, I'm sure the child was only maybe about two years old and it went missing and it was found absolutely miles away over two mountain ranges at the top of a mountain, naked and dead. You just wonder what is actually, it's like, I mean, there's, they never you know never find any footprints. There's no sign of a struggle. It's like they've just been... Sounds like a like a Franklin cover up situation where the kid gets onto an airplane, he gets um, uh, molested, they kill him, and then they throw him out, and there he is, naked on top of a mountain somewhere, you know, where he, he couldn't be. That's and that's what like if you read the Franklin cover up, I mean, that's kind of what it is. It, it I don't know if it's because of the internet giving so many more people a voice. But it seems like the pedophilia thing is kicked into overdrive big time. But this uh, kid was know. taken from a park, Joe, taken from yeah. his, his, his parents. And this is only like a day later. The yeah. child just found two mountain ranges away on the top yeah. of the mountain. How does that, do you know what I mean? Yeah, I know. How That's what I'm you, saying. I mean, it's not as if he's going to be thrown out a helicopter or a plane or anything because... I mean, how would you possibly do that? Take the child and then take Sasquatch. him away somewhere, get to a plane, go up. Nah. Sasquatch. It's just weird, honestly. Yeah. The amount of children that go missing, though, and not just children because there's adults go missing well, as Of course well. they do. But I'm telling you, man, I think it, I think it has a lot to do with, the, you know, the ritualistic stuff, the pedophilia and even, uh, even you know, the missing persons. I, I, I really believe it's because. Well, these the are easy places so... to take children and things from, Joe. That's the thing about it. I mean, you yeah. would never in your your wildest dreams when you were on a maybe a camping trip that your kids can't go that far from you anyway. So you would let them go a wee wander. But the thing yeah, is, yeah, this day and age, I you know we, my wife and I feel like we have to maintain control at that level somewhat because it is different than when we grew up. 
you know, um, it just seems like because of the hypersexualization of society, people will go to uh, go much farther. They'll do things to realize their fantasies um, much more than they would have in the past. And so, yeah, I mean, you have to, I can't, my mom would lock the door of the house. <laughs> she wouldn't let me come in sometimes because, you know, go play outside, that kind of thing. But you got to be careful these days. You really do because things have gotten crazy. And uh, you just see so many stories of children disappearing, you know, for whatever reason. That and, and you know, I I also think we do have to look at the angle that, I mean, we are talking about an extremely vast forested area that covers an extremely large, you know, right. uh, chunk of land, and that, um, you know, when you're talking about an area that large, that large, I mean, people are going to go missing, and. You know, it, it really it can be a blink of an eye for a, a bear or a or a or a mountain lion or something to just snag snag a child and just drag them off somewhere, you know, extremely too, quickly. Yeah. yeah, you know, and you know, you're not going to really, you know, animals can carry a you know their their prey into really weird places, right? I mean, areas that humans really can't get access to, and so. Uh, I mean, there, there's all kinds of possibilities with this. Um, I think when you're talking about, like I said, a, a forested area that a lot of people travel to for vacation or go hiking or, or take their family for camping trips, or you know, you're going to have people that end up going missing. It's just kind of the the way <laughs> the way it is. But I mean, it is really weird though how many how many uh, children disappeared in this forest. It's pretty crazy. Mm. Yeah, I see. That's the thing. Is it? Is it? It could. It, could it be like a a mountain lion that has a taste for child meat? Almost like. Well, I mean, I mean, think of it. I mean, if if you're if I mean, animals are smart, right? If, if they if if uh, if there's like a mountain lion or a group of mountain lions that know that, hey, look, these humans always come through this area. You know, they're bringing their kids with them. You know, you know. You know, animals like that, they wait for the perfect opportunity to, you know, snag a, uh, snag a small prey or whatever. Just like if they were hunting a, a, a small deer or something from its parent, you know, you wait until the, um, the older, you know, the, the, the older prey animals aren't paying attention. And then you snag the young one, drag them off somewhere. I mean, that's just how a predator operates. So, uh, I definitely think it's, uh a possibility that, you know, maybe some of these kids just got, you know, were unfortunate victims of the wildlife out there. You know, that's why you got to always pay attention to, you know, where your kids are at at all times, especially if you're in a area like that with wild animals, you know, forested area, you nature, nature can be cruel, man. You gotta, you gotta, you gotta pay attention to that stuff. We talk about it quite often, but are UFOs a part of that nature. Apparently there's mm. a, the Metro over in the UK has explored this as they ask, is there a scientific explanation for all of these alien abductions? Whistles. Could it be an alien abduction that took that kid? You know, yeah, like it could be that kind of thing. You know, I don't know. It says you wake up in the middle of the night covered in a cold sweat. You can open your eyes, but not move any part of your body. You feel a strong presence and can hear the sound of voices, footsteps, and whirring machinery as dark shadows move around the room towards you. Belief in aliens has increased steadily since the birth of modern research in the 1940s and 50s following the supposed cover-up of an alien spacecraft crash in Roswell, New Mexico in 1947. Surveys in Western countries have shown that as many as 50% of people believe aliens exist, while a landmark but criticized poll in 1991 showed that 3.7 million Americans believed that they had been abducted. Now, there's, is there plausible scientific reason for alien abduction? You know? And so apparently, yes, there is a professor 
Chris French is his name, that specializes in the psychology of paranormal beliefs and experiences. And he's doing a study on this. And so he, to him, the a, a classic example of like sleep paralysis, a terrifying but su- surprisingly common experience, um, given how few people know it exists, actually is it could very well be a like a byproduct of it, we'll say. Something that's not measured, you know. Maybe you did. Maybe you're just coming out of it. The other thing that a lot of people um, say with this is that it's government, government research, and that it's not aliens, that it could be your own. I think uh, my, state. yeah, I think the my labs, what you're talking about there, military abductions, right. they're probably more common than we would like to actually imagine. And if you think about it, they would probably, not probably, they definitely have the technology to implant memories in us where we oh, yeah. think we've been on some alien ship but that's not to take away from other people who you know claim that they have been taken to ships i think that does happen i really do i do too but i mean if you wanted to mask your operation to blame it on a boogeyman if you will aliens then what better way to conduct it than to make it stage it to make it look like it's an alien abduction. The alien straw man agenda. Exactly. All Does right. that say that aliens don't abduct people? No, of, of course. I truly believe that there probably is. There's visit, visitation and probably abduction or something of that matter. But hey, you know, the military, I would imagine that high up in the ranks of the deep state, they probably know and understand um, what's out there, who's visiting, how it's happening. Think about uh, it they, the other way then, right? Think about it the other way. Flip it. If we, well, we do, right? We're, we're, we're going out there, we're looking at other planets and that. Mm-hmm. And we find a planet with civilization, you know, kind of advanced like ourselves. You just know the first thing we're going to do is launch black ops. I was going to say, we're going to nuke it. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to want to examine these creatures we're going to want to know everything about them dude uh, you know probably the aliens look at it the same way i would imagine so i would imagine if if see now this human arrogance says that they think like us that perhaps they're constructed like we are who knows they could be totally a totally different form of life than we can even interpret I mean, think about it. We only see, what, 5% of the visible light spectrum? What's around us that we don't see? That was was the interesting thing about Doctor Strange, the movie. I got to go back to that because it was really, I mean. The biggest secret is probably it's going to walk off that ship and look just like us. But Johnny Whistles, Scotty, what do you think of this one, guys? Mm, Well, I mean... My brother uh, suffers from sleep paralysis quite often, and I've never, you know, heard him espouse that he's been abducted by an alien. So uh, I think there's a little more to it than just cu- sort of passing it off as sleep paralysis. It, it, it's back to the thing like uh, Ken Webb always says, right? Swamp gas, right? <laughs> right? Swamp gas. They, they always come up with some convenient excuse to explain something and uh, this just kind of sounds like one of those things again where they're they're trying to twist some kind of yeah, logical right. medical I explanation for something right. that for that something no, that it gen- yeah something that they that they don't understand and they really have no explanation of exactly i yeah, agree I, with I, you i get honestly i get really angry when i hear that sleep paralysis crap every time that that comes up when somebody said they've been abducted. Not everybody. I've you know experienced I mean? it. I've uh, experienced sleep paralysis. Personally, yeah. it, you know, here's, this is when it gets me, believe it or not. Is it, and it hasn't happened in years because I just don't have the ability anymore to, or the time to take a nap. But I, when I took a nap, and if I slept outside of the covers, right, not to like go to sleep, sleep, but just take a nap, I would fall asleep And then I would wake up and be in like this sleep awake type of hybrid situation where I cannot open my eyes. 
as hard as I try, I can't open my eyes. It's like I'm stuck sleeping, but I know what's going on around me. And the only way to really snap out of it for me is I have to roll myself onto the floor. You know, like, poof, oh. And, of course, you're not left with any unexplainable implants after you've had exactly. sleep. Well, no, I, I, I'm not feeling it right. Exactly. Yeah. John. Well, Kev, um, Ronnie Wood, one of the Rolling Stones, said that he saw a UFO in Brazil, but I'm not sure if that's down to the drugs he took in the last maybe 40 years. But interestingly, Kev, do you know what I mean? He's seen one as well. So, yeah. They're out there, Kev. The thing is, we know it is. It just if we talk about it, we tell anybody about it, but absolutely nuts. And if you say that you've been abducted, then it's just sleep paralysis, an excuse for everything. And you know something else that's along the kind of alien kind of lines, whistles. It, it could be alien. None of us know what they are. We we'll speak about black-eyed children, right? Woo! That's enough woo for anyone, you would think. Turn up the woo dial yet again because we're getting the black-eyed adults now, Johnny. Kev, that that story absolutely is amazing when you think about it. And I think we have to share it again. That's why, I mean, we covered it on KBS, but it, I mean, it's huge when you talk about black-eyed children, the woo crew here and the audience, a different audience now, they'll want to hear this, man. Well, Kev, this latest report comes from a woman in the United Kingdom named... Esme, who said that she's met the black-eyed adults and they killed her boyfriend. I just found uh, today that I wanted to tell you about an adult BEK experience I had back in May 2012. At the time, me and an ex-boyfriend were living in Lee Woods just outside Bristol. We had many strange experiences in the three months we were there. But this one takes a biscuit. We were leaving to go to work one day around 10.30am and went out in the towpath at the bottom of the gorge. Right there were four people walking along. The first, a short middle-aged man with a pointy grey beard and completely black eyes. The second, a very tall middle-aged woman with the black eyes. A third is a teenage boy, roughly 17, 18 with black eyes and a troll-like underbite with what seemed to have fangs protruding upwards. And the fourth was a very large, beautiful black girl. And the rest were extremely pale white, around 20, 21 years old. Now, the path was flooded out. Some puddles in the towpath were up to about a foot deep and they weren't stepping in the puddles without even looking at the ground. Says, and I, I tell you, it's impossible in flood season, even when you're paying attention to do what they were doing. The skin didn't seem to fit them, and they moved in a very strange way, almost like their limbs were bending in places where there were no joints. The two older ones looked at us and said, Good morning, with this really unsettling smile. But the black eyed adult said nothing back, which is really odd. And it's a very friendly city where strangers often talk to one another. The troll-like teenager looked dead ahead with a really angry expression in his face. And the girl looked happy but vacant, like she was hypnotized, just staring into space, walking in front of him. The clothes were modern, waterproof coats and walking boots, apart from the girl who wasn't wearing boots. She had intended to come into the woods and she was wearing flat pumps, which nobody in their right mind would wear in that uh, path in the flood season. What adds to the, further, the mystery further is the encounter that exactly one year later, my ex tragically died at age 22 in one of the keys of that same river the towpath follows. It was reported that he had hallucinated a girl called Sally throwing herself in and speaking to her. He couldn't have saved her, but he refused to let anybody rescue him until he'd rescued Sally. There was a lot of residential boats in that quay and a lot of people heard him shouting for her and trying to help him. The police looked in the quay for a second body for hours after he had died, but concluded that she'd been a figment of his imagination. Now, 
Oh. That is an amazing story, really. I mean, I don't think that the black eyed children killed his, uh, killed her boyfriend. May, God knows what it was that actually jumped into the water that he had seen that nobody else had seen. He had heard the cries as well. So, um, it's quite a scary one that, do you know what I mean, when you think of, I mean, what were the, is this black-eyed children with a kind of a dog that looks almost like a troll with teeth pointing up the way, it, it, out the side of its mouth? It looks like it's like a dog kid from other, another dimension, just, and it looks like a normal family with a crazy, mad sharp teeth pointed up with a dog that can't be from here. If that's a normal thing, that's in another dimension from us. You know, Joe Joseph was the man that really opened my eyes and taught me the fact that the Bible, the stories in there, and the times back then were like Lord of the Rings, right? We often laugh and joke about the fact that we're living in the times of Noah. And when you start like putting all these stories together that we talk about, especially strange ones like this, I mean, talk about Lord of the Rings. It's happening right now all around us. And we'll get the guy's thoughts on that after the break. Imagine leaving people thinking about black-eyed children and black-eyed adults over the break. Terrible. But stay tuned, folks, because right after Freaky Friday... Chris and Cherie Geo. That's right. We are back and we are moving into the second half already of tonight's Freaky Friday right here on TFRlive.com. You must be enjoying this one tonight because this has been like a Freaky Friday on steroids. What absolute cracking stories we've covered so far. Before the break, we were getting into the black-eyed children, and dare I say it, possibly black-eyed adults. And we yet to get Joe Joseph and Scotty Lopez's thoughts on this. So, Joe, I'll come to you first, because Scott's got lots of other stuff to get into as well after he shares his story or his thoughts on the black-eyed adults, man. I really don't know what to think about the black-eyed adults. <laughs> it's so crazy. Uh, uh total possession that's what i'm saying that's what it is mm-hmm. yeah I, I i think i'm gonna go with uh, joe on this one i think yeah, it's uh, some sort of a supernatural um sort of phenomenon that's occurring yeah that i i just can't explain i just don't know what exactly is going on but i i do believe it has to do with some kind of a like yeah, do you believe kind of pos- that do you believe like humanity has the power to tap into different things that were different. Sometimes it's different frequencies people think of. Um, I don't well, know. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, mean I, I think, I think people are able to channel into, into different energies. And, you know, if exactly. you can't, con- if, if you can't control that, then it's going to take over you. I, I, exactly. That's what I'm thinking is happening, you know, and who knows what's bringing it about. I, I don't, I don't know, but they're just like, it, this is one of those things that just seems to be a lot more of these days than you heard in the past. And I can't, I can't tell or attribute it to, is it because more people are connected now than ever before? Or is it actually happening a lot more often? I don't know. You know, it, it's hard to tell, but man. It's crazy, and I th- I'm telling you, people are tapping into things they shouldn't be tapping into. Well, yeah, and, and this whole this this goes into the whole, you know, um, <laughs> you know, lowering of the veil. You know, we yeah. now now we're talking about sort of a lot of the stuff that you know CERN and stuff is doing, and you know, we go back to a lot of this uh, D wave stuff, and um, you know poking holes in, 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 in the dimensions and those holes are never going to go away. They're always open now. And the more we play around with this stuff, the more you're going to see weird things like this occurring. And so, you know, I don't, I don't know. It's, uh, it's definitely, it's definitely weird, but yeah, as far as the whole like black eyed children and these black eyed adults and stuff. Yeah. I, I would have to lean towards uh, some sort of a possession sort of phenomenon taking place there. Yeah, 
Yeah, that's the only way I can really make it make sense in my head. And it's just based on all the other things that, that we've seen is that, you know, this could be the result of all of the shenanigans we've done, you know. How about all the nuclear testing that was done? You know, you were talking about it before the show, Scotty. You know, all these big tests where they were detonating 50, kilo, uh, 50 megaton, 100 megaton uh, warheads. You got to think that unleashing energy of that magnitude would have repercussions on an interdimensional scale. You know, like it's often said in the alien community that those were really the events that got aliens' attention. You know, yeah, that, I mean, because well, cause think about it. What, what occurs in that particular point of space where where a nuclear detonation occurs at the very center, at the very core of a nuclear detonation, do they even really know what happens to space and time and, uh, you know, on a, you know, on a physics quantum physics level, whenever you release energy of that magnitude, you well, know, what, what happens? They're, they're learning now with CERN being able to smash these particles together at such high rates of speed that I think they're starting to understand what happens now. And, you know, that could very well be kind of like that, an interdimensional lighthouse, if you will. When one of those goes off, think about the signals. Again, we only perceive 5% of visible light. What is it doing to the other 95%, you know? And how are how is it interpreted by any other intelligence that's out there? And so when you yeah, look at it, 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 it almost became like a signal saying, yeah, "Hey, exactly. look, look, look at these guys! Are they've uh, reached a level where they're <laughs> they're uh, you know splitting atoms?" Uh, yeah, or or even like even from a demonic st- standpoint, you know, it's like all of a sudden, blah, 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 look, look at that! Blah. Let's go snuff out the light. Blah. And so here we here we go and look at look at the world since then. I mean, ugh. we've definitely gone down the wrong the the wrong way, if you ask me. I, I don't know. It just but what's the right way? Who knows? Mm. It, it, that's the thing is it, when you look at uh, then you talk about uh, alternate universes and and things like that where you can really have an unlimited amount of universes and outcomes. If you start talking probabilities and, and go into the quantum, then all of this has happened before, and this is just one of the outcomes. This is just one of the universes, you know? So this stuff just, it, it's really, all, all I can say is it seems like there's more of a fusion between dimensions, almost like they're coming together almost. They're interfacing, if you will. Yeah, I, I would call it bleed through. Yeah, that, yeah, very much. So. That, and maybe that's where we get the Mandela effect too. You know, mm-hmm. who knows? Very interesting indeed. What and about so, you? Um, Do you think that's where the Mandela effect comes from? Mm. I, I like An- Anthony Patch's take on it, where it's like it's spinning these particles in my head, and it's yeah, it's yeah. I mean, it, when you think about it, it's there's no way that they can change everything. Do you know what I mean? You go back exactly. and right. like change right. every Bible, every movie, everything. So it's got to be our brain. Our brain has been changed in some way. So that's the only. It, it's the only plausible explanation, really, for the Mandela effect. If everyone remembered the same way, which doesn't happen with these Mandela effects, I'm not saying anyone's right or wrong, then that would mean that they'd literally gone and changed everything, like your Bible changes overnight, Joe, what, whatever example you want to use, but yeah, it definitely seems a lot more plausible that it's us that they're playing with. And yeah. That's, you see some people, they don't see anything's changed, they always remember it the, the way it was, and other people lose their minds over it, and Right. 
Exactly, and somebody ought to tell Freddie Mercury, Johnny, how his own song ends, because I was watching a live gig <laughs> from Wembley the other night, and he, he finished it the way we remember, he put of of the world at the end of We Are The Champions. Somebody That's ought- amazing, Bill Kev, you look at, can you remember the the guy standing in front of the the tank, was it in Tiananmen Square? And there were, I must have read about four different versions of of what happened to that guy. Now, I can remember nothing happened to him. People remember the tank running over him. Do you know what I mean? Other people said there was blood all over the place. That's not what I've seen. I've seen a guy standing in front of the tank. It didn't run yeah, over him I've, or anything. That's all I've ever seen. You know, Dr. Kayak in the chat, you know, I've thought about this as well because he says, sure, they can change everything. Time travel. And like I say, everyone then would remember it's changed. And the fact that there's some people that don't remember, some people do, some people don't have a clue, what's, nothing's changed to them, and yet there's people like us that has. Then if they went back and changed it, wouldn't you guys imagine that everyone would remember that? It's... Well, everyone would notice that change or else people would say that it's always been the way that it's just been changed to when if you have gone back in time, you'd always have seen it. All of us would remember it the same way. Yeah, that's true. It just shows you, do you know what I mean? It, it is having an effect. But the thing is, it's only affecting some people, Kev. That's, that's the thing about it. So That's why I think it rules out the time travel thing. Yeah, it could be because then, yeah, because it doesn't affect everybody. Exactly, we would all yeah. remember the same thing. We all remember the same thing. Yeah, we'd all be having the same Mandela effects, but we're not. But imagine, I mean, how to be able to pick and choose like that just seems like wow. <laughs> <laughs> that's like that's crazy. Or we're all slowly going crazy, and we're just overanalyzing it. Well, or but, but if you look at it, almost like. Are they able to get into the code of the construct to be able to rewrite code on that level, to, on that specific level? If you well, look at it that way, it's not so it's not so unbelievable. No, definitely not, because we go back to it all the time, but it's the perfect example here because you've got the D-Wave guy, Ladzinski, Ladzinski, when he was, even before he made the D-Wave, watching a quantum biology presentation, and they were talking there about these tubulin dimers that are basically quantum bits. Our brains are quantum computers, right? The quantum effects lead to thoughts, stuff like that. So I suppose you could extrapolate from that. Then if they've built this machine that's basically modeled on the brain, and we see the human brain project and all the neuroscience that goes on, we know exactly what synapses to fire to create certain thoughts, then why not? Why why couldn't they be able to do that, Joe? Right, but I guess what I'm saying is, think about it like this. If, if they're able to... I, I believe that every human being <clears throat> is tied in to, you know, quantumly to a collective consciousness, if you will. Or that creative force, so we all have, we all have a, a a a pathway to it, you know, and that's where a lot of people experience it through prayer and and other means, ritualistic meditation, yoga, whatever it is. However, you get there, you get there, and um, so we all do that. Now they've created something that's modeled after the brain, almost to put like an artificial node into that creative force into that collective consciousness and then able to go in and manipulate things because now they have an in. So now they can go in and perhaps do they know enough how it works to be able to manipulate the reality for people, but certain people, you know what I mean? That's wild. But if you look at it that way, as if the they're hacking the construct now, I mean, I can totally, I get it, you know, but to, I've got to, a, go I, I've ahead. got another, I've got another uh, Mandela effect that might blow your mind. Okay. Okay. You remember Ed McMahon? 
Oh yeah. You no, know, John Johnny Carson's co-host Ed, Ed McMahon. Sure. Um, during the eighties and the nineties, what do you remember him being the spokesman for on TV? Oh crap. Oh, he, he did. What was it that, that, um, he did the eighties, um, that, uh, talent show. What the frick was it? Um, he was popular in the eighties. Yeah. He, yeah. He, he, he and Dick Clark did that freaking um, show together too. I can't even remember what it was, but damn, it's been so long. Well, they, they, they all, he also did the, cause I, I kind of don't want to, if you, oh, if you don't remember, was it though? I remember I, he was a spokesman for Publishers Clearinghouse. Ah, yeah. there you go. Okay, was it? Guess yeah, what? that's what it was. Okay, but guess what? What? It wasn't Publishers Clearinghouse. Oh, you lie. It's now something called American Family Publishers. What? I've never heard of anything like that. Yeah, me neither. I always remember him being the spokesman for Publishers Clearinghouse. You yeah, know, okay, when they go, right. to the, go to the people's houses, give them the check, you know. That was so, it. It was Ed McMahon. Yeah. Well, not no more. That's that's not what it was. You lie. <laughs> Dude, it was Publishers <laughs> Clearinghouse. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Wow. So, so you that, just got that, me. That one real. That one really blew my mind. I have. Literally. I've. I've had no. That's the first I've heard of that, and it was always Publishers Clearinghouse. Oh yeah. man. See, that's crazy. Why would they hack that? <laughs> I mean, come on. That's crazy. It's all Kev's fault. I'm gonna blame him for it. Me too. Kev, well, you Ke- are Kev, 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 responsible. While, while you were gone, I just blew Joe, uh, Joe's mind with another Mandela effect. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Kev's <laughs> eating biscuits there in the background. He's, so he's, he's eating haggis. And silent. He is. <laughs> haggis volivants. Haggis. Rudely interrupting my cup of tea and my biscuit that's terrible uh, but my, uh, my spot of tea if you will yeah yes come uh, on. living up to the stereotype i got you okay good hey by the way speaking of biscuits you'll like this one would you take a bite out of a 106 year old fruitcake nah. <laughs> well they just found one down in antarctica that's right. And scientists say it actually might still be edible. Yeah, it says uh, San Francisco Gate reporting. Move over, Twinkies. You've been bested in the food that refuses to decompose department, and the contest wasn't even close. Conservators with the New Zealand-based Antarctic Heritage Trust recently discovered a 106-year-old fruitcake in Antarctica's oldest building, a hut on Cape Adair. A fruitcake, of course, is a dense brick-like confection spiked with lumps of dried fruit and nuts that's traditionally regifted at Christmas. It's known for its long shelf life, although not usually 100 years. <clears throat> um, so the Lizzie Meeks, who found it, said there was a very, very slight rancid butter smell to it. But other than that, the cake looked and smelled edible. Mm-mm-mm. Well, if it lasts that long, Joe, that shows you that we don't need chemicals and we're bread and things, you know what I mean, to make it yeah, last I mean longer. That, dude. That's right. Absolutely. It says uh, conservators believe British explorer Captain Robert Falcon Scott probably brought the cake made by the British biscuit company Huntley and Palmers to Antarctica during their ill-fated 1910 to 1913 Terra Nova expedition. The expedition's northern party took shelter in Cape Adair which had been built by Norwegians Karsten blah, 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 blah. I'm not even going to try and pronounce that last name team in 1899 and they left the fruitcake behind so there you go so would you take a bite of it for a million dollars? absolutely I'm yeah I would too a million bucks I'm doing it take I, will take, for a million. I will take 24 hours of the squirts for, uh, for a million bucks <laughs> oh yeah mm-hmm. just saying Count me in. <laughs> Only if no. I get my tea first. So there you go, Kev. So so you could, you know, enjoy that along with your biscuits. Mm-hmm. 
<laughs> well, yes. Joe. Yes. Now, have you ever heard of Walt Disney banishing Rasputin's ghost from the Disneyland's haunted mansion? Say it ain't so. Really? What the hell is? What does Rasputin have to do with Disney? Well. See, the Haunted Mansion is one of the most beloved attractions at the Disney theme parks, thrusting visitors into a spooky world filled with dancing phantoms, eye-popping special effects. But there was one spirit planned for the ride who was so scary that Walt Disney himself barred him from the inclusion, Rasputin's ghost. On August 9, 1969, the Haunted Mansion made its debut in Anaheim, California's Disneyland. To rave reviews, Disney's Imagineers had managed to capture the picture-perfect representation of a classic haunted mansion. The attraction was a technical, technological marvel at the time, featuring a blend of state-of-the-art animatronics, the old-school theatrical illusions that wowed crowds, and established the Haunted Mansion as a signature Disney icon. But what you might not know is that the development of the iconic ride began nearly two decades earlier. Walt Disney first began mulling over concepts of the Haunted Mansion in the 50s, enlisting many of his favourite artists to help bring the project to reality. Initially, hey, uh, Al- hey, hold on one second. Hey, uh, Alistair. Alistair, uh, hey, Walt. Uh, yeah, I was wondering, I get some ideas about this haunted mansion I'm thinking about building in my theme park. <laughs> come on, come on, who are you? What experts? That's all I want to know, you know? Well, the attraction was designed with the storylines that would have featured the ghosts of famous historical characters like Jack the Ripper, Guy Fox, Ivan the Terrible. Now, somewhere during the haunted mansion's 20 years of development, Disney Imagineer Mark Davis decided that Gregory Rasputin, the seemingly unkillable Russian mystic, would make a favorite, a fabulously frightening phantom. Now, when it takes stabbing, poisoning, shootings, and a clubbing and drowning to adequately kill someone, there's a good chance they'll make a pretty scary ghost. Now, Mark Davis began to draw a suitable spooky portrait of Rasputin, capitalising on his hypnotic eyes, but designing a painting that would gradually morph into the eerie, all-seeing eyeball. Now, the creepy concept was well received by the other Imagineers, but when it hit the desk of Walt Disney, he immediately rejected Rasputin's ghost. As it turns out, Disney wasn't frightened by the idea of having the infamous healer take up residence, but even with his gruesome demise and dismembered penis, but was far more afraid of being sued. At the time, Gregor Rasputin had only been dead for a little over three decades and as such still had plenty of living relatives by the family members, well-publicised death still fresh in their minds to have used Rasputin in the Haunted Mansion would have been an invitation for legal trouble and, to be fair, angering the family of an infamous, infamous Russian wizard is probably a terrible idea to begin with. But, I mean, there's the story that, I, I mean, I thought that he was going to be doing some seances and things like that, but... Uh, it doesn't matter, man. You've got Walt Disney, right creepy, woo-filled topic there. you got Rasputin as well, and I suppose he was, he was like a kind of... He was a pedo. Well, who? Walt, Walt Disney? Um, yes. Oh, well, he was. No, but... I, I don't know. I don't know if Walt Disney was. I mean, I, I do know that Rasputin was. Well, you know, you got to look at some of the content and that's hidden in these children's cartoons to get a flavour for all Walt Disney was all about back in the day, Joe. But Rasputin, he's another interesting character, isn't he? Because he's almost like a Crowley, isn't he? He was doing his own kind of magical yeah, stuff. Yeah, exactly, right. Yeah, he worked with the royals over there at one time as well, over in Russia. So, yeah, it's quite freaky. But Disney, you could sit here, you could do a full show on Disney, all the kind of hidden subliminal messages that are in Stop. There. Don't ruin, don't ruin my childhood. Man. Even Club 33, dude. Don't 
that do group, Club 33, Disney's private kind of club, 33, is that like telling Why you something? You gotta, no, it's telling me nothing. I don't, no, la, no. la, 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 la. Be here, Joe. <laughs> Bill, man, heads in the sand, heads in the sand. What is it really Project mean? Monarch. <laughs> it reminds me of the BBC, dude. It's like the BBC. It, that is America's version of the BBC. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> You're not going to get me, dude. He wasn't a pedo. Come on. He was, dude. He was all about love Allegedly. and... Allegedly. And Mickey Mouse. Of course, yeah. Of course he was. And mind control. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not buying it. Joe, uh, not I, Joe, you'll have to look at some of the things that he's put out there. I know it's true. I know it's true, but I'm not I'm not going to go there. Can't. Can't do it. Yeah, I'll, I know we're going to ruin your childhood, but <laughs> All more childhoods have been ruined. We had the BBC. They even given that stuff out for I don't know how many years when I was a child. So well, at least we didn't have Mr. Dress Up. That's all I could say is at least you and I, you know, UK and, and the United States, at least we didn't have Mr. Dress Up. Thank God in heaven. Because that was about as bad as they come. Hmm. You guys remember that, don't you? No. <laughs> Nope, give it so, Joe. So Mr. Dress Up uh, was actually aired on the Canadian Broadcasting Company, uh, like their their thing, and it was pretty doggone interesting. He had a tickle trunk <laughs> that, <laughs> that he would get the kids into. Yeah, yeah. This was a public... Um, like a public television show akin to Mr. Rogers. CBC. It's very yeah. similar to BBC, isn't it? Very, very same thing. CBC, BBC, it's all the same. PBS here. But yeah, yeah, he was like the Canadian Mr. Rogers. And um, yeah, you'd have little sleepovers and all that kind of stuff. And yeah, I get my tickle trunk. <laughs> You just wouldn't get away with that nowadays, man. No, of course not. But I mean, it was like blatant. That it's almost like uh, you know all these. Well, it's one hour to go. And speaking of woo, have we got some woo for you? Apparently, there is a new creature, slant entity, slant thing that lurks out there and uh, whistles. You got to tell us about it because <laughs> I, I, I can't even repeat it. I just, I don't get it. <laughs> well, Joe, this is the first time I've heard this as well. And when I, Oof. when I read through it, it's actually uh, quite old. Now I'll get to that part in a minute, but now this is from the Week and weird, which is a fantastic site. If you want some woo, it says, investigating the link between the shadow man and the terrifying hat man visitations. Now, it says in the countless online accounts of paranormal investigations, they've taught us anything. It's that there's no shortage of terrifying supernatural entities to fear. With the Internet's recent obsession with the black-eyed kids and shadow people, you might not notice another phenomenon that's quickly becoming part of the paranormal pop culture, the hat man. Now, shadow men, shadow men weren't really thrown into the paranormal spotlight until around 2001, and that was all thanks to the most pr prolific paranormal radio presenter, Art Bell. Anyone unfamiliar with the Art Bell, firstly, should be ashamed of themselves, and secondly, should go and listen to every episode of Coast to Coast that you can get your hands on. Now, it, there's plenty of authors and bloggers, investigators, who would love to take credit for uncovering the mysterious Shadow Man phenomenon, but their first real public mention goes back to April 12, 2001, when Art interviewed... Thunderstrikes, First Nation elder, teacher and co-founder of the Deer Tribe, Metis Medicine Society. Now, during that episode, the pair talked at length 
about the topic of the shadow people and even encourage listeners to send in their own drawings of the terrifying phenomenon. As it turned out, way more people than anyone could have anticipated were experiencing these strange things as well. Now, over the years, there have been plenty of debates whether or not these shadow people are actually good or evil, many landing on both sides of the fence. Now, the medium Amy Allen has spoken quite publicly about her belief that the shadow people are interdimensional entities, which we were all talking about that as well, that fall on the side of evil time and time again. Now, the hat man appears much in the same way that the shadow people do, but unlike the phenomena that was made popular by Art Bell, the hat man encounters bear a few striking differences that set it apart. When he appears often during the night, the hat man is always seen as wearing a wide-brimmed hat, and though most people are unable to make out any distinct facial features, he's usually described as a solid black mass. Witnesses are often unable to describe the hat man's lower body as if he seems to float silently above the ground. One said, I saw a tall human figure, and the figure looked like that of a man. The man had no distinguishable, no distinguishable features. I could see no eyes, no nose or mouth, only blackness. He looked like a shadow, only darker, much darker. He had a very wide-brimmed hat and a long trench coat that flowed as he moved. He stood there for what seemed like an eternity, then moved very slowly and without sound back into the hallway just out of view. Now, for the phenomena seems to centre around basements and, according to experiences, appears to manifest in situations of intense negativity and family dysfunction. In fact, many times... If one person in a household has started experiencing visits by the hat man, it's almost guaranteed that another member will begin seeing the strange shadow man soon afterwards. Uh, We've spoken about the shadow people uh, often enough because, I mean, we had uh, our guest Valeria, and she said that there was two, and they were seven foot tall, pure black, and she could make out the outline of them, but they had no face, no nose, no nothing, just a How shadow. My my daughter, probably about six months ago, uh, she was up in her room, and in the doorway to her room, she said she saw a man standing there in a hat holding a box. And that was it. I mean, I think he, he said like a couple of words, but I can't remember what it was, and it really didn't have much to say uh, – any bearing on anything it didn't make any sense but it affected her so much and it was so real that she actually came down she had a, a like a bed railing to keep her from falling out onto the floor they had bunk beds you know she had broken that off and turned it into a pike <laughs> and like seriously was shaken telling us about it wow and and it just yep just this guy in a hat was this, in your life? was this in North Carolina? Yeah, 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 yeah. Wow. That, that place, it does not surprise me. Now, I have to ask, Joe, is any of that kind of activity used to get anything in the new place? Yeah. Yeah, no, we get it from time to time. But see, that stuff follows you. It's not, I, I don't believe that houses yeah. are haunted. People, people are, are followed and haunted. Those are just inanimate objects. You know, I, I mean, you can imbue them and they can have um, certain characteristics. And maybe maybe there is like portals and stuff that are that are actually there or gateways. But as far as entities themselves, I think they latch on to people. I'll be honest with you. I really do. So, yeah, Kev, you got a couple of good ones on you. Like interdimensional. Oh, absolutely, Joe. Yeah. Interdimensional leeches. It's like me and you were saying today, Johnny, isn't it? Yeah. It's like somebody's put a hex on me. They're just going to keep me alive and punish me all the way, isn't they? <laughs> it's the same <laughs> thing that happens so to my wife. It's the only way that that's her her real, her, her Achilles heel is her health. It's the only way that these, uh, these uh, demonic spider monkeys can go ahead and freaking chink her chain is by affecting her health, you know, because 
she's, you know, resolute in her spirituality and she's resolute as far as her values and everything else are concerned in her mind. So they attack her where she's weakest and that's physically. And everybody has their weak points and that's where they, that's where they kind of leech on these leeches. And of uh, course, if you go to Alistair Crowley's old house and start calling them out, probably it's going to happen. <laughs> yeah, probably will. Yeah, hindsight's a wonderful thing. Yeah. yeah. It's one of those, I hate to say it's one of those I told you so moments, but oh, you it was going to get crazy. <laughs> you really did. Talking of crazy guys, right? A few years ago here in Glasgow, we had one of these eclipses, right? And I say one of these eclipses because really yeah. I don't see it as anything too major. But what is going on in the US right now? And don't get me wrong, I'm not playing it down because, I mean, I know like totality covers the US and things, but it seems to be a whole lot of, well, in my opinion, overreaction. But you guys are there. I mean, what's uh, not? is it though? I don't know. I mean, <clears throat> now we went, I remember experiencing an, an eclipse. I think it was the same year the Challenger exploded. Um, there was yeah, it was eclipse. the late 80s because uh, I remember. I remember it too, you know, being really young. Uh, yeah, it was somewhere around the late eighties. I want to say like 87, 88, maybe you know, it wasn't, it wasn't around the challenger time, but I don't remember, um, but I know that there was an eclipse mm-hmm. and, and I mean, I don't remember people going crazy. I, the only thing they said was don't look straight at it. That was it. Common sense, isn't it? I mean, you, you don't want to be burning your eyes out. So, so now apparently there's a whole lot of preparation underway for Eclipse 2017. I mean, a lot. Oregon Live. I guess Oregon's right in the um, in the totality zone, if you will, of the Eclipse. Their, their hospitals are stocking up on blood and rattlesnake bite antidote. Apparently, they're saying that, you know, things are going to go crazy. There, there is a big push, Scotty, for... Uh, that this is going to like make people go nuts and there's going to be all sorts of crazy stuff happening. Yeah. I I mean, I I, I don't know. I mean, (sighs) so it says here, listen to this. It says hospital systems from central Oregon to the coast, all hands will be on deck in the run up and aftermath of this eclipse. It says without precedent, without a precedent, planners have turned for advice to their counterparts in Sturgis, a town in South Dakota that attracts about a half a million people for a yearly motorcycle rally in August. Apparently what they're saying is, is because they're going to have so many people flooding in to these areas that are normally rural in nature or perhaps not able to handle all of it. There's going to be a lot of accidents, you know, like, Oh, here's a rural com- community that, you know, maybe they don't because there's not a lot of people there. They may have rattlesnakes that just come around and people are going to get bit because there's people where there normally isn't. And it says, uh, without precedent, a planner has turned to these these uh, people in South Dakota. They say one of the key things that was learned was the need for acute care services oftentimes uh, just mimics the increase in the population. It says that means more patients with food poisoning, more patients with broken bones and strokes and heart attacks. It also means more emergency surgeries for traumatic injuries. Because you have so many people going into this narrow what is it like a 70 mile zone that just goes across the country? I think yeah, it is. And, and, and where I'm located, I mean, we're like on the very, very edge of that zone. So where I'm at, it's like, um, going to be like 98 or 99% totality. So you got a lot of people flooding these rural areas and that's why I think you're seeing a lot of these, this emergency prep. And these petty <clears throat> reptilians, man, you can just picture them right now hanging about the rocks like that con. You know the eclipse well, is coming, right? I didn't even consider it, you know, <laughs> until they, well, until they, they brought up the whole, the, you know, the bike rally thing. Then I understand you have a lot of people that flood an area in a very short period of time. People saying that you see Nabudu when it all goes dark, you know? Could be. Who knows? It's out there. I'm just throwing it out. Now, if, if if we're looking at things from an electric universe point of view, yeah, what kind of uh, energy do you think would be aligned and channeled through an eclipse like that? If you're lining up the sun, the moon, and the earth, um, you know, what kind of energetic effects do you think that would have? I don't think any. 
it's like I say, one of these paths, not, it wasn't full totality here in Glasgow, but that was up in, I think it was the Orkney Islands, or the Faroe Islands, I think it was filmed, John, wasn't it? Every, yeah. Everything was all right there. Energetically, I, I, I'm not sure, but there certainly wasn't any reports of Wi-Fi or anything like that going down. In fact, if you would, I mean, I don't know, no astrologer or astronomer, but if you've got the moon in front of the sun, then if anything, you're going to have a bit of protection for the time it's there, you know? Yeah, 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 yeah exactly. Better Wi-Fi yeah. signal. <laughs> now, here's the other question. What do you think these elites that are into numerology and events like this are going to be doing? Ah, now you see, this is where we have to pay attention because, like I've said before, it doesn't matter if we think all these things are nonsense. That These people really do. Over the ages, they've lived by the movements of stars and numbers, guys. Exactly. So it, it makes it makes you wonder. Um, and, you know, I, I've even heard reports that up in northwest, uh, like in Oregon and stuff, where this uh, eclipse is going to initially be coming in at. I mean, they have all kinds of like emergency preparations and, you know, like all this like weird, like high alert stuff going on. And it just makes you wonder, are they using this eclipse as maybe an excuse to prepare for something even bigger? We'll probably see a celebrity going down over the over the course of the eclipse as well. But sacrifice, you know? Mm. And, you know, with all this... Uh, <clears throat> with all this escalated tension with North Korea and stuff happening, it just kind of makes you wonder. Yeah, Paul Begley, though, says it's the end of the world. Seriously? <laughs> Seriously? And again, I want to reiterate the fact that I have never said that September the 23rd will be the end of the world. Where did this come from, Whistles? I got asked in the chat earlier on as well if I was one of these people claiming that the world was going to end. Where, where did this come from, John? Because I know you bust me about this one as well. Yeah, well... Is this actually, one of the trolls again? Come on, tell me. No, 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 Kev. I think that you maybe not have said it, but you might have implied it. And I answered uh, a message uh, to somebody, one of our listeners the other day, and I ended it with this message will self-destruct on the 23rd of September. I've never implied the world will end, dude. Oh, Kev, come on. Everybody knows you think the world will end. Although you've not said it, you've implied it. Oh, no, I'm not. <laughs> no, I can't, I can't go along with this one. This is not good. Not good, Juju. No. It's the end of the world as we know it. They'll probably cut off, cut off the as we know it bit by the next time you play that song, John. Yeah, I know, Kev. Mandela. People have changed. I think these are all suffering some horrendous Mandela effect. Or maybe I am, where I don't remember saying it. See? There it is. It doesn't make it real. No. Kev, the chat are all actually waiting on the end of the world because you foretold it. <laughs> you see, no way can you put that <laughs> on. No way, right? Before this gets ridiculous, Scott, what kind of scary ooga booga creatures are we going to see before, well, before nothing? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not saying Well, I, I have a little, uh, an interesting little um, article here pulled up from uh, Atlas Obscura, and uh, this kind of just goes back to, you know, a lot of what ancient cultures thought during an eclipse and uh, anyways it says uh, five mythical eclipse monsters who mess with the sun and the moon uh, from cosmic serpents to demon warriors these creatures have been blamed for celestial mayhem and it says uh, armed with a little science modern humans can relish in the celestial mechanics of an eclipse without fearing the end times but it wasn't always that way uh, before we recognized the moon's potential to block out our sun and vanish into Earth's shadow, we saw answers from the gods. Without a full understanding of planetary motion and celestial alignment, we attributed the disruption of solar and lunar cycles to cosmic monsters. While it's tempting to interpret such tales as purely explanatory, the relationship between natural phenomena and myth isn't always so clear. We often don't know 
uh, to what extent ancient cultures created stories to explain eclipses or saw their existing myths reflected in the movements of the sun and moon. Certainly generations of tradition allow mythology to evolve and fulfill various cultural purposes. Uh, Global Eclipse Mythology features uh, as rogues a uh, gallery of the moon, thieves, and moon-hungry behemoths. Uh, meet a few of them now and remember their uh, audacity the next time you gaze up at an eclipse. Um, and so here we go. We're going to go through some uh, a few of these... Uh, uh, a few of these crazy. Uh, creatures, yeah, a few of these crazy <laughs> creatures that uh, that different cultures believed in. Uh, we have Apep, the moon serpent, uh, from ancient Egypt. Uh, many solar eclipses, or many solar eclipse myths, revolve around the duality of light and darkness, good and evil. As you might imagine, that puts a rather nefarious spin on the sudden obstruction of the midday sun. Thus, the ancient Egyptian cosmology gives us Apep the cosmic world serpent. Uh, Apep, or Apophis, embodies chaos and death, making the monster a natural adversary for the sun god Ra. The serpent pursues Ra, pulls the burning uh, sun disk across the sky, lighting the world. Every so often, Apep nearly consumes the sun disk, resulting in an eclipse. Luckily, Ra and the defender's aboard his sky barge, always managed to fight free of the serpent's shadowy coils. Hmm. There's, there is Egypt's uh, sort of rationale for it uh, from back in the day. Now we have uh, Rahu, the beheaded Azura from Hinduism. Uh, few eclipse myths can match the horror of Hinduism's Rahu. Originally known as um, Svarbanu, the wrathful demigods sought to live forever by drinking Amrita, the nectar of immortality. Lord Vishnu wouldn't stand for this, however, and decapitated Svarbahu uh, before the liquid could pass down his throat. The decapitated head became the undying Rahu. Uh, divine... Ooh, whoa, that's a weird word. Uh, Kamupepenance uh, left Rahu with something of a chip on his shoulder and also with no shoulders consumed by rage. He continually seeks revenge on the sun and moon for informing Vishnu about his nectar theft. Rahu chases the sun and moon across the heavens relentlessly and occasionally catches them. But since Rahu is but a floating head, his victory is always temporary after he swallows the sun or the moon, uh, Either orb simply falls out of the out of Rahu's neck <laughs> stump and continues his journey. So that was pretty interesting. Uh, we have the Sabetu of ancient Mesopotamia. Uh, the plague god era brought doom to ancient Mesopotamia, and the Sabetu marched in his wake. The offspring of the sky deity on these seven demon warriors marched in his wake. The offspring of the sky de... Oops, sorry. I've read the same thing over here. <laughs> uh, the seven demon warriors spread sickness and death and occasionally gathered uh, in the sky to blot out the moon. Uh, the epic era and ism written in the East Semitic language of Akkadian, sometimes around the 8th century BC, describes the seven warriors as so deadly that their breath of life is death, and also relates that Era mainly likes to let them loose on Earth when the clamor of human habitations become noisome. Uh, the Sabetu might seem rather casual eclipse monsters, but their moon-blotting ways may have served a royal purpose. Uh, the Assyrians saw the eclipse as dire omens and particular lunar eclipses amounted to divine condemnation of the king. At times, this required the ritual death of a, of a substitute king or Sarpui uh, who perished in the king's uh, place. Historian uh, John Z. Wee speculates that Sabetu may have functioned as a way of absolving the moon associating king of guilt. Uh, why stage an elaborate sacrifice when you can simply tweak religion to cast yourself as a victim of intermittent demons? Sounds like that cremation of care thing that goes on at the 
Bohemian Grove, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, very, very mm-hmm. interesting. Um, we have some more here. If you would, if you want me to continue on, or uh, well, just we got sh- two more left. On you go then. Rattle them out, man. All right. So we've got um, Skull and Hottie from North myth- Mythology. Yeah. Um, <laughs> when something dreadful happens in Norse mythology, uh, you can safely assume Loki had something to do with it. Uh, the trickster stupid god Loki. managed. Yeah, stupid Loki. Oh, Loki up to his old tricks. What was that movie? Uh, Wait a minute. What was that movie with um, uh, Matt Damon, uh, Ben Affleck, and uh, George Carlin? And George Carlin was like this priest. He was a Catholic priest, and he was trying to get. Um, he was trying to get like more people to buy into Catholicism or whatever. And uh, Dogma? He, I think that was the movie. Dogma. That was the name of the yeah, movie. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. So whenever you said that, when you started talking like Loki does everything, because I think um wasn't um Matt Damon, he was Loki, wasn't he? <laughs> that was his name. Yeah, I, I think and he like so, destroyed yeah. everything. Yeah. Yeah, it was pretty cool. That was a that was a real good movie too. Yeah, it was awesome. It also had Jay and Silent Bob in it, so... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Anyways, continuing on here, it says, The trickster god managed to father the ultimate world-consuming serpent, the queen of the underworld, and, uh, and a god-slaying giant wolf. Uh, that wolf, uh, Fenrir, spawned the eventual doom of both sun and moon in the lupine duo Skull and Hottie. Yes, everything Loki touches turns to Ragnarok. What's the last one, Scott, before we hit the break? Okay, uh, let's see here. Let me scroll down here. Um, The Perry of ancient Persia. Even sudden blotting monsters aren't above redemption, and the Perry of ancient Persia proved that sufficient cultural change can erase all cosmic wrongs. Back in the 6th century BC, the Perry were small winged humanoids uh, in pre Zorus. Zoroastrani, er, uh, Zoroastrian Persian traditions. Like other fairy folk in global myth, their relationship with humans ranged from casual ben- benevolence to, uh, to mischievous destruction. Aco- according to folk historian Carol Rose, they might help you find, uh, they might help you out of a tough spot, ruin your crops, or darken the sun. The Perry continued in this role for more than a millennium until Islamic culture rewrote them as reptilian, fa- re- oh, repentant fallen angels. <laughs> reptilian sounded better, dude. Reptilian yeah. and more woo. Uh, later tales described their uh, penance as um, complete by the end of the first, first millennium. Uh, they even appear in the epic poem uh Shana May as loyal servants to earthly kings. So oh, who'd have that's the- Welcome back everyone. This is Freaky Friday right here on TFRlive.com. Unfortunately, this is the last segment, but don't fear because right after this show, don't go anywhere as whistles will say at the end. Then he touch that dial because Chris and Shiri Geo, they will be live with Beyond the Veil. No reason to go anywhere, because right after that, and Lickety Lass was saying she'll be having her cup of tea in the morning when she gets up, just as Brent Thomas goes live with Paranormal Portal. Absolutely amazing night of radio ahead, wherever you are. So, guys, we're moving into the last segment here. We're going to go back to whistlers in a moment, but one of our listeners, Andrew, and he was in the chat room earlier, Bison, I think his name was, he sent me quite an interesting little tidbit today, and it's a, I suppose it's relevant to the topics we're about to go into here, Whistles. He says, talking about AI and robots, etc., et potentially wiping us out, the film Term- Terminator was released 33 years ago, and it just happened to be released on, you guessed it, or in 1984. So there you go, Johnny. A bit of a number woo there to launch us into mm. Was it DNA hacking? Well, Kev, this appears to be the first successful hack of a software program using DNA. Researchers say malware they incorporated it into a genetic molecule allowed them to take control of a computer used to analyse it. 
The biological malware was created by scientists at the University of Washington in Seattle who called it the first DNA-based exploit of a computer system. To carry out the hack, researchers led by Tadayoshi Kono uh, and Louis Seze encoded malicious software in a short stretch of DNA they purchased online. They then used it to gain full control over a computer that tried to process the genetic data the genetic data after it was read by a DNA sequencing machine. Now, the researchers warned that the hackers could one day use faked blood or spit samples to gain access to university computers, steal information from the police forensic labs, or infect genome files shared by scientists. But for now, DNA malware doesn't pose much of a security risk this, the researchers admitted to pull off the intrusion, they created the best possible chances of success by disabling security features and even adding a vulnerability to a little-used bioinformatics program, their paper. Uh, the exploit is basically unrealistic, says one expert who's a geneticist and a programmer. Now, he says it's very unrealistic that this thing can actually take over a full computer if it was um, backed up by the software that was trying to protect it. But Kono is among the first to show how to hack an automobile through its diagnostic port, and he also later gained access remotely by attacking cars through their Bluetooth connections. Now, Kev, this is quite... A new one, do you know what I mean? That DNA being used to hack computers, and it only had like four characters A, G, C, and T. That's exactly it. And we were covering this kind of earlier on with Tony because I was talking about Craig Venter, how back in 2010, when he was making synthetic bacteria to prove that it was his own bacteria, not just some naturally grown one in the lab, right? What he done was he spliced in there, it was the names of all the creators and the people who worked on the program. He also yeah, that's crazy. A number of quotes as well. I believe there was a series of images in there. And long story short, I mean, you can come forward to present day how they encoded a film into the DNA. And like Johnny says there, there's only the four kind of base nucleotides you can use. So you've got that A, C, T and G. So if you can encode names, you can encode images, and you can inv actually encode a movie into this DNA of a bacteria, and then three generations later it's still got that movie there, then I see no reason why you could get a blood sample sent to the forensics lab. You've kind of encoded some kind of virus in there, a Trojan horse, a backdoor oh, yeah. of some kind. Theoretically, why not, guys? Why not? Yeah. I mean, it... And how do you trace that back? I mean, I, I don't know. Uh, it would seem to be somewhere where no one would look. Very clever. Yeah, uh, very clever not, indeed. Not science fiction, definitely not, because uh, definitely potential for that. I mean, unbelievable. Yeah, it just shows you how, how far it's got then, Kev. You know what I mean? That they're using DNA. Uh, and you think oh, of it. I too mean, fast, man. What one kind of like gram of DNA, they say, could solve all of our storage problems in a heartbeat because it's the most naturally efficient storage medium in the world. And it obviously is. It contains everything, every piece of information that goes towards making us who we are, making us the individuals who we are, passing on our traits down to f future generations. I mean, it's unbelievable the kind of data that you're talking about there. I think I read once it was in the petaflops kind of scenario when you look at all the, air quotes, junk DNA and the stuff that they have mapped. I think the stuff that they have mapped, Joker, is it not something like 3 million or 3 billion, I think, base pairs, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, it's, it, it, it's something crazy. Yeah. Um, and then if but, that's only like 4 or 5% of it, Scott, you've still got all that, air quotes, junk stuff as well that they have. Yeah, yeah. 
quote unquote junk DNA. Yeah. I think a lot of a lot of this uh, goes back to you know what I've been talking about lately of our genetic memory. You know, <laughs> how do we know that something wasn't coded in our DNA a long, long time ago, and we just haven't been able to access it yet? Right. Uh, we haven't been able to figure out the data. The number thirty-two is encoded in our DNA, Scott. What What would you say if I told you that? Mm. That was a Clyde Lewis show I heard one time. I'll need to dig more into that, but it was scientists had said that there is a number encoded into our DNA, and it's thirty-two. What's that? Are we variety thirty-two? If you look at the monkeys, they're thirty-one. Is it thirty? It's it's very it's very interesting to say the least, and I think. Um, I think a major thing is that we just haven't been able to figure out what what this information is that's encoded in our DNA and we have to reach a certain level in our civilization and our intellect um, before we basically crack the code I think and once I, we yeah, once we crack the yeah, yeah I think I think once we crack the code then that basically means that we're ready right we're ready to move on to the next that we've reached that point but and until then, it, it just shows that we're we're still we have a long way to go, and we're still not capable of doing it. But we're heading in that direction, and that's the that's the thing. We're starting to figure all this out. Um, well, it, it's well, what better what better way to sort of hide a message or keep a message alive, you know, instead of scratching it on rocks or putting, you know. Well, that's uh, what we're talking about, that bacteria, Scott, when they encoded that movie in there. And then they realized that it, it passed down the generations. They were almost calling it like time capsules. You could put information like a hall of records into some bacteria and just leave them about. Yeah, as long as the species is able to survive, the message will always be there. Well, Kev, that 32 number that you said, that goes to 32, 64, 128, 256, 512. No. Oh. It's all those numbers that we talk about with the, the quantum computer. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. A very good point, Johnny. And that's what I was saying to Anthony the other night as well. The fact that it just so happens that the number of tubulin dimers in our head as well follows lockstep with that scale you were going there, Johnny. 65,336. Right. How can that? How can that just randomly happen? Why not thirty-seven? Why not thirty? Yeah. Joe, that's a good question. I mean, it, there would appear to be some sort of intelligence behind this. You know, certainly not random. It's a pattern. So it's I mean, certainly a pattern. Yeah. Yeah. That's well, crazy. You know, if we were like theoretical scientists, we'd be getting paid bucket loads of money to come up with ideas like this. <laughs> Boy, I wish. <laughs> <laughs> we would. You know it. The world would be a much better place if we were theoretical scientists, Kev. No, because I would uh, quickly employ Elon Musk to save the world, Joe. Same here, dude. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. People, be like, Elon, you got this. People are throwing things at their PCs right now, honestly. No! Why does he get such a bad rap, dude? I know he's building, like, underground condos for, like, the elites with his boring company. I get he's just, that. Just, that. He's got a, a diversified portfolio, if you will. <laughs> well, you know. He's teaming up with Venter. Did you know that? Who who wouldn't these days? <laughs> I wouldn't. <laughs> just saying. I'm I'm with Naga Ward in the chat, and he's got it right. Every time I think about that guy, I think neural lace, and it just puts me right off. Him. That, yeah, same here, man. I mean, but but at the same time, I can I can see applications where that might actually be beneficial. It would just have to be rolled out right, you know. And the problem is, is humanity never rolls it out right. There's always somebody that takes advantage, you know, or takes it too far. And it's just, it's going to end in big, big failure. I mean, like, there's, some big is coming. I don't know what it is, but something big is coming. And I have a well, feeling it's, it, that it, it has it's to always, do with that. 
it's always sold on the merits of the good that it can do and it sure. gets people to accept it. And then once people accept it and the camel has its nose under the tent, uh, then, you know, that that's when we start having problems because once it's accepted and once it's, uh, uh, you know, spread out and being, it, it being utilized on a mass scale, that's when you right. start seeing people use it for, you know, use it for wrong. And, you know, I know people hate on Musk, right? But think about it this other way as well. I mean, Johnny, coming from Scotland, we've got a proud history of inventing stuff. Dude. We kind of shaped the world in some ways, right? And then you've got somebody like Elon Musk, maybe not an inventor, but a big dreamer, goes after big ideas, game changers. You know, when this AI, this artificial super intelligence or artificial general intelligence really gets going, I mean, the generation that's to come, there's going to be no creativity left. I think it'll take over all of that. We won't need people to come up with ideas for science. It'll be doing all that. You know, inventors, that will all be gone. He's probably one of the last of his kind, whether good, bad, indifferent, irrelevant. These kind of people ain't going to come along anymore. No, that's right. They said, like, in 10 years that AI is going to be writing top 40 songs. It's going to be writing uh, best-selling novels. <laughs> there won't be any and I'll always um, get originality left, Kev. And exactly, and the whole kind of nature of the beast is it will always get better. I'll listen to one of these symphonies that the AIs put together, guys, and if I didn't know it was done by an AI and you played that in amongst three, four other Beethoven or Bach or something like that, I would have been none the wiser. I really wouldn't. And it gets better and better over time. People won't, there won't be a need to have any creativity or anything. It, it makes me think of a... Uh an anime series that I used to be into back in the nineties called Macross plus. And the premise behind the, uh, the show was that there was this, um, artificial intelligence entertainer per se, a pop star, uh, called Sharon Apple. And all it was, was like this black monolithic box that would project holograms and do shows and make music and stuff for everybody. It was the, it was like the big entertainer. Um, it was, it was like a rock star. It was make, it was, it was making the best music, you know, and, and people were paying to basically just see this, uh, this, uh, artificial intelligence black box, uh, perform for them. And what ends up happening, um, during the series is that, uh, this uh, this artificial intelligence pop star basically goes rogue and ends up taking control of of everything because its base uh, its AI was sort of based off the emotions of a real person, right? And it took the emotions of this real person and it couldn't really like interpret them properly, and it kind of like went rogue. You know, it felt the sadness and the anger of this real person and it started taking over like military facilities, hacking everything. And they ended up having to fight this thing that was originally just a AI pop star that just went crazy and ended up, uh, uh, <laughs> ended up just like, like taking over weapon systems and stuff. It was, it was really crazy. Um, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of really good, um, good animes from the nineties that cover a lot of this stuff and sort of like, um, they were sort of like, uh, foretold a lot of these things that we are covering now. Um, if anybody has, hasn't had a chance to watch Macross plus, I think, uh, it's a very good, uh, you, I, I highly recommend it. It's a pretty good, uh, pretty good series. You know, if Elon Musk hears about that, he'll tell you the solution to that horrible nightmare scenario. Be the neural lace, Scott. Give everyone the neural lace. It'll understand the emotions. Then you see, I'm only joking. <laughs> yeah, and and the two and the two guys that are the, the the sort of the um the 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 guys that had to sort of fight this uh, artificial intelligence. They flew these like experimental aircraft, you know. And one of the aircraft basically was one of those things where it was like a neural lace, and the guy was sort of tied into the AI. And then the other, um, the other guy who flew his experimental aircraft, it was all just analog and based off of his just, uh, skills. And it was sort of a, uh, there was a 
sort of a duality there between like the the pilot that was depending on the AI and then there was like the pilot that depended on his own instincts and it was it was really interesting. Wessels shoot it. Give me the gun, Kev. Oh yeah, I need to go and get the gun, Johnny. Okay. Oh, I'll get the gun before the end of the show, right? Because the AI ain't going anywhere. Don't you worry about that, right? No. It's just going to get worse and worse as it goes. It's exactly. the thing is, if if we get the AI that is so far advanced that probably nothing can stop it, then and twenty. What did they say? Twenty twenty two is when five G is being rolled out worldwide, right? That's I think that's the goal. So, so it yeah. <laughs> the damn thing that's right so 2022 is i think the goal and if that's the case that's where now you're going to have the bandwidth to be able to have that ai basically tentacle out you oh, know what i mean my, my 5g router which it has a 5g channel on it you know it prefers that it's, it's a hungry little thing i'm bathing in it joe it feels great right now but <laughs> kev i got one extra megabit download today nice look at you mm. what does that take you up to mr johnny 5.4 that's like your old hamsters joe mm-hmm. <laughs> i remember those hamsters well the good old days of 10 down and 0. 0.7 up <laughs> See, they've, they've, they've 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 been donated to mr ken webb he's currently um in possession of the hamsters. Yeah, he has the hamsters now. No, now my 200 down and 200 up. <laughs> Much better. It's, it's nice, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. You know, Johnny, you need to move closer to the hub of the smart city to get the full advantage of the Orwellian state that I'm in. Oh, Kev. This place is, honestly, it's unbelievable when you think about it. Your picture taken 300 times a day. It's yeah. probably one of the most... Um, over uh, protected cities in Britain if you can imagine because everywhere you go there's yeah. not a street that you can turn in Glasgow where you're not seen by a camera somewhere it's right, and, and, and tie AI into it you know yeah it's crazy I mean, why, why do we need uh, microphones and cameras and bus stops I mean to hear the conversation of two old ladies what's that all about don't get any of them with our stage on so the you? ai can know exactly where you are and then when it does and it decides that you're too big of a threat it will design a dna specific weapon that will then take you out with its drone force that's where we're at why that's not what i'm saying it's crazy triangulate with some cell towers maybe even via pulses in your phone you know why not yeah everything's frequency resonance mm-hmm Absolutely, man. And you're done. I mean, we're that close. That's why I'm saying it, something's got to give and give here soon. Meanwhile, everybody just lives with their head in the sand. But it's going to be a hell of a surprise. I, it's crazy. And I, I really don't know if there's any way to stop it. I just don't think it's going to happen. Still glad I'm here at this time, though, to see what's going on. Holy moly. Oh. Crazy. Speaking of crazy, blind quantum computing, since we're talking about 5G, Fizz.org is talking about it. For the first time, physicists have demonstrated that clients who possess only classical computers and no quantum devices can outsource computing tasks to quantum servers that perform blind quantum computing. That's right. Blind means the quantum servers do not have full information about the tasks that they're computing, which ensures that the client's computing tasks are kept secure. Until now, all blind quantum computing demonstrations have required that clients have their own quantum devices in order to delegate tasks for blind quantum computing. So now China, who is really like taking the bull by the horns with quantum encryption, quantum computing, um, teleportation uh they've really gone crazy now they're talking about if you got you want to do some quantum computing from home no problem (laughs) you'll have access to these quantum servers 
Yeah, this basically goes into what me and Kev were talking about. I think, what was it, last Freaky Friday or the one before where, um, you know, as this quantum technology goes forward, it's Mm -hmm. not going to be where you own a quantum computer. It's you're going to have access to basically the quantum cloud, right? So you'll you'll be just on your your regular computer or your regular device, uh, but you'll have access to this uh, quantum technology via basically the cloud. Uh, You'll just um, send your problem or whatever you want to do to this uh, quantum server, the the quantum cloud, and it will... uh, it will uh, crunch the numbers and do what it needs to do and then give you an answer. Man, I wonder how, how you look at this kind of technology and you just wonder what the interface is going to look like in five years, ten years, knowing how, how fast things are, are developing and advancing. That's the big thing in Silicon Valley right now is they're looking for software developers and UI developers for to create um, basically um, user interfaces for the operating systems that these quantum computers are going to be you know going to need to use because you have to have something there for the uh, that that a user can can relate to you know a, a user friendly interface so you can interface with the quantum computer and I, that's the big thing now and in uh, Silicon Valley is they're, they're basically looking for quantum software developers. It's exactly like Bill Gates did with his windows. He needed a, a user interface that, um, that people yeah, would because, get used to. Yeah. Yeah. Because, because not everybody, you know, was, you know, not everybody could sit there and learn DOS. Right. Right. Mm-hmm. It was much, it was much easier to have a, an operating system with a, uh, with a user-friendly interface, and that's what they're working on now with quantum computers. Is you, you got to have some kind of a user-friendly interface so so that people can access the stuff. Um, you know that you know, was without Lord Sugar, Lord Alan Sugar, a really successful business tycoon over here. But he was the guy behind was it Amstrad computers, Johnny? Yeah, it was Kev. Well, he says his biggest ever regret in computing came when some little geek walked into the office with glasses on and he was trying to sell him this stupid thing about windows and he's sitting there thinking what do i need that for when i can just sell the unit and of course who he was talking to was bill gates and it's one of the biggest regrets he ever had because he didn't see that fact that you needed that interface no use of a person can't interact with the thing and like you're saying I mean, nobody hardly learned DOS, and who only knows what you'd have to learn to interact with a quantum computer? So, yeah, this is the big thing. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And um, like I said, one of the big sort of uh, like techie sort of uh, nerd channels on YouTube, which is uh, Linus Tech Tips, like I said, he he got to go to D-Wave and... Mm -hmm. um, he, he got to, um, they gave him a tour. And like I said, they were actually doing maintenance on one of the, one of the D wave computers. So he actually got to see them open it up and actually see the processor sitting inside of the, the super cooled refrigerated chamber. Um, and yeah, like I said, that that's, it was directly from the guys at D wave that were saying that they're like, we're looking for software developers. We're looking for people that, that can, um, write, uh, software for these quantum computers because we want the general public to be able to access this and, um, you know, be able to access it with ease or, well, or have our clients be able to access it with ease. We're almost out of time, guys. And before Good we, Lord. it would be rude not to give Jordy Rose a shout out because we do officially know now that he does listen to Freaky Friday. Love so it. Shout out to D Wave and the team. We love you almost as much as you love us, Gordy. But we'll be back next week, folks. 